Welcome to the Independent Characters, episode 225. This episode we are titling The State of the Galaxy. AKA Storytime with Papa Tuttle. <laughs> that was your that was your subtitle. Yep. Uh yeah, so the the whole point of this episode is really to um y- you know, it came across we were talking to somebody recently. I think it was when we did the um Warrior Lodge. And I don't remember who it was on the Warrior Lodge that said, well, I really only started playing in 8th edition, so I was not aware. Yeah, uh, Nary's. Nary's on the That's Community right. Warrior Lodge. Yeah, <clears throat> mentioned that. That's right. And it occurred to me, we had had this on the list for a while, but it kind of changed the way I approached it because it occurred to me that we have a lot of players now playing this game who <laughs> were like the old guard now. Right, yeah. <laughs> And, uh, you know, there was a time where nothing changed in the 40K universe. Nothing. For a long time. Yeah. And you yeah. got you got a codex update once every couple of years if you were lucky. Right. If you played <laughs> Marines. <laughs> yeah. If you played Marines. Um, and uh, if you played Blood Angels, well, you could look at the White Dwarf for your codex. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there were dark times. Or joint codexes where it's like uh, Dark Angels and Blood Angels had a... Combined that's codex. Right. That was that's right. Way back then. So the point being, um, for a long time, Games Workshop did not move the lore forward. Everything looked backwards in the 40k universe or the current state of the situation. And around seventh edition, <clears throat> they started moving things forward. Yeah. Uh, and if you go back and listen to previous episodes, we talked about this many times and i was pretty opposed to moving things forward to me 40k uh, the the galaxy that they've set is a setting not a story correct yeah yeah to me yeah this is not how everybody feels um and so my take on it was you don't need it's two minutes to midnight you don't need to move 10 minutes or a minute to midnight or whatever the phrasing is we, we would use um the the galaxy is massive and yeah. there are yeah. tons of stories that you can tell within that massive galaxy not everything has to hinge on a fulcrum point of of ending you know world you know, galaxy ending or imperium ending yeah, yeah. because oh, honestly a lot of the lore is imperium focused yes imperium centric and a lot of even the xenos lore is told from an imperial yeah. perspective like yeah. all, all the naming conventions for tyranids are names that the imperium has applied to tyranids right yeah. they don't call themselves that right they call themselves <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh and so anyway my point being here is that uh, there was a lot to catch up on especially as you've gone from seventh eighth ninth now tenth edition yeah even 10th edition has moved some things forward. And so I thought, what a great opportunity to take a look at where were we in 5th, 6th edition? Where are we now? Like, what, what has happened now? And how, what's the state of things? Because a lot has changed. As I started, I was telling you before the show, as I started creating the show notes for this, I found myself going like way too into detail. Like, then this character did this, and this character did that. That's not what we're going to cover here. There's a lot out there. I had to back off of this. And what we want to do is kind of paint in in broad strokes. Like, here's how things have have changed. And so I'm really going to focus on some key things that shifted the direction of the 40K universe, but also kind of how Games Workshop was thinking and and what players were expecting and, and that kind of thing. And that's kind of where where we'll go with this episode. Yeah, I think that's a great take. Um, okay, but before we get into that, we have to talk about show sponsors for the Patreon. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Jeremy Johnson and Justin Hill, of all people. Like, I again, I randomly, <laughs> I randomly, I pick like, here's the number, and then I go look at who who is that number. Yeah. I did not even know Justin Hill, the author from Black Library, was a Patreon supporter. How about that? Love it. Yeah, thank you both. Yeah, thanks, man. Um, and 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 the other thing, uh, Jeremy Johnson, who also randomly got picked, was funny because he had made a comment on the Patreon like chat thing that said um, that he was here for all the F one talk. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I'm starting a new podcast. It's going to be just me talking about <laughs> F1 to nobody. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Shell. You get, I'm sure you get people. And it'll be that. just for Jeremy <laughs> Johnson. <Yeah. laughs> so, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, anyway, we've talked about what the show concept is. We, we thanked our, thanked our wonderful sponsors. It's fantastic. Let's move into elite choice. Sounds great. I will go first. Yep. Uh, so I chose Campbell McLaughlin and his Primaris jump pack captain for the black Templars, which made it onto the Warhammer community yeah, I did. board. I, I got to tell you, like, I've known Campbell for years now. We took a trip to Europe at one point. Before we ever met in person, I was, I don't know how it happened. I was just like, well, we're going. Do you want to go? And it's like, yeah, okay. Sure, okay. <laughs> so it was like the first time we met, we got along swingly. He yeah. calls me, jokingly, he calls me his ham dad. Yep. So I'm very proud of my ham son. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is beautiful. Yeah. I have, I've seen multiple armies from Campbell in person. I get crushed every time I play him. <laughs> um. So uh, uh, I've seen his his um, his uh, ultramarines I've, for 30k. His black templars are just gorgeous. Yeah, they're incredible in person. I yeah. got to I got to see him when I went up to his house um, earlier this year. That's which right. Was I really forgot cool you did to, that to see uh, in person because I'd seen a bunch on Goonhammer and some of the stuff that, that he paints is featured on Warhammer Community. But this one was like front and center. He got like the article headline yeah, image on cool. that, so which was rad. Yeah. Which was coincide with the Primaris jump pack. Yep. Marines, which was so funny <clears throat> that I was talking about those a couple episodes ago. And I'm like, wow, I really wish they'd come up Primaris Jump Pack. And then a couple more <clears> days. <throat> I'm not going to say who, but somebody who is in the know said, oh, by the way, take a look at this. <laughs> I'm like, oh, look at that. Right again. Here I'm, I'm, yep. Look, yep. when I'm right, I really got to <laughs> hone in on it because I am wrong so mo so much more often than I am right. So anyway, that was my choice. I think this is a fantastic looking model. Yeah, and and uh, love Campbell and and love the work he's done. So. Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah another great addition to that, and really cool to see it called out in such a uh, kind of pride of place spot on Warhammer. Community. For sure. Yeah, for sure. All right, what do you got? Yeah, I went with uh, Jimmy Barris and his sweet adaptation of the Warhammer Plus uh, Vindicare Assassin model. Mm -hmm. um, so that I, I love that model, but it is kind of awkward because it really just kind of sits in this floating like head of a sister statue, and it's it's a little awkward as a game piece. It's a really cool as kind of more of a display piece. Yeah. Um, and what Jimmy did here is. Uh, Actually, I think took it to the next level. It's still going to be more of a display piece than a game piece, but they 3D printed uh, this entire sister's statue. Yeah. So it, and this is now to scale to fill in the body uh, for the head that the the statue, um, that the yeah. existing Vindicare uh, came with in plastic. So they, they did a lot of uh, modeling in order to cut down the head of the existing statue and... Um, kind of fill in the gap and make it mesh up with the the actual Warhammer plus Vindicare assassin model. And I thought it was just such a cool concept and bringing it to life. Like you got the 3D print, you have modified that 3D print to integrate the existing GW yeah. kit in there. Uh, and <clears throat> it's just it's just a really, really cool concept and beautiful execution. Like love seeing that assassin now perched on the full the size full model yeah. statue instead of just kind of this uh, uh, more abstract kind of head as as piece of train as base yeah um so it, it's not going to be the easiest thing yeah. to play with yeah, like, I'm just, just going to move this statue imagine, around I move, yeah, exactly exactly my assassin now gets towering i can see over <laughs> everything uh but it's just it's it's beautiful it's a really cool idea and a uh, really well done and, and inspiring i really liked it's a lot of work it's for, a lot of work for what's going to yeah. effectively be a display model right but, uh, Did he say is it removable? It's probably not. I don't think it I is. I think yeah, that would yeah. be a little extreme. They uh, He cut into the 3D print. He had a friend 3D print the statue, the full-size yeah. statue, and then cut down the statue in order to integrate the the Vindicare kit. Um, and I think, yeah, it's it's cut down and green stuffed and, and all that in the backside. So, yeah, I think it's locked in, and it's just a, a really cool piece. Like, even yeah. if it – I mean, you, you can have it on a – the do. battlefield and your assassin just doesn't move. It's a Vindicare. He doesn't want to move anyway, so that's fine. Uh, just sniping, sniping people from across the battlefield. But just, yeah, again, a really, really cool piece and a, a neat project from concept to execution. So very nice. Props. Very nice. Congratulations. And then, of course, the new Shell's Kiss segment. There you go. Uh, and Shell uh, 
you know, and he's milking this terrain. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. But she called it out, and I was like, all right. You know, because first she's like, cool, can I call it terrain? And I said, if you're looking at that Necromunda terrain from Brett Barker, <laughs> we've already talked about it. She goes, well, this is what I really like about it. And she she said, you know, now he's taken a nice photo of it. Yeah. He's, he's implemented moss on it, which yeah. always... Bags of moss are like super cheap to get. Yeah. Super easy to add to your, you know, battlefield and they add a lot to it. Like it just makes it look and really for, cool. For the underhive terrain that's so just kind of barren and desolate stark. and stark and depressing and grimy and things like that, just that little pop of green in there is it's a really nice touch and really adds a lot to the environment yeah. of that of his board, which is incredible. So Yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> so it's an incredible board. He took a great photo of it. Oh my god. Shell, <laughs> Shell was like, and, and for Shell, everything's Space Hulk these days because oh, yeah, yeah. of the thing. And she's like, she's like, this would be a great board to play Space Hulk on. I'm like, you realize like I have a whole Zoom Mortalis. Yep. <laughs> like, you got to add moss to it now. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. well, okay. So I'll go buy some bags of moss. You know, they are, they're great. Yeah. It's, it's so congratulations again, Brett. Yeah. <laughs> Got to get relegated to legend soon, Brett. Not on the one, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> There's only so much we can do with one, but it is it is great. I love. Please keep sharing them. Yeah, we will not keep talking about them, but but it it did deserve some recognition. Again, I think he's done a fantastic job, and that is a lot of work. To yeah, paint absolutely. All that stuff, so. Yeah, great job. Uh, yeah. You got anything else you want to talk about before we kind of kick off the start of the show? Or yeah. Um. No, no games played. Well, we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, nothing, nothing specific All right. All other right. than um, I'm, we're recording this right before the Marines Codex comes out. So there's kind of, for me, there's been this little like kind of little pregnant pause of yeah. like trying to figure out what I want to do with 40K and where I want to focus energies between Marines and Eldari and that army sure. and things like that. Uh, and I've got a Titanicus event coming up next month. So just kind of in, in between projects and trying to figure out where I want to throw in my uh, hobby, hobby focus to just, you know, what, yeah. which area yeah, yeah. Um, I tend to do a lot of hobby work in the winter just because the, you know, it's dark a yeah. lot more and the weather's not as good to do fun things outside. And you're um, a, you're an outdoorsy guy. I'm an outdoorsy guy, so yeah. I like to take advantage of that. So I'm uh, I'll be ramping up quite a bit soon, but I'm trying to figure out where to focus that. All right. All right. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll talk about all that in just a minute. Again, yeah. <laughs> so uh, we're going to take a short break, then we're going to come back and we'll uh, leap into uh, Hoppy Progress. Okay, and we're back, and uh, yeah, we're going to talk about our sparse hobby progress that <laughs> Josh already <clears throat> alluded to there. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and go first. Uh, so I did do a little bit of painting, not of 40K specific models, but I did use the uh, Army Painter Speed Paint uh, paints for the first real time. Like yeah, yeah. The, the new 2.0 paints, I was sent a, a whole set of them, uh, and... Uh, what I did was um, I had backed the Kickstarter for this game called Oathsworn, and with that came some terrain. Uh, <clears throat> so it's like some rock walls with moss on them. It's uh, some trees because it's supposed to be this area that's like overgrown with with uh, nature's taken nature's taken the taking world the world back, back yeah. kind of yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Although it's not very natural how it's doing it, <laughs> and uh, and then there's a couple houses like medieval style houses that come with with the set. And, uh, you know, I, I, I decided, well, let me paint these things up. So I did the old slappy choppy, uh, on these guys and used through my airbrush, the speed paints as a filter. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, amazing. Nice. Yeah. Like super good. Yeah. They feed through airbrush. Nothing really needed to add to them. Um, you know, I took some of the lessons that I had learned when we were working on the night Lords with Caleb uh, and so, you know, I, I basically, if, if you're, if you have your head in a hole at this point, uh, you know, we undercoat black, we dry brush real heavy, uh, a dark gray and then, uh, dry brushed, uh, a kind of lighter gray and then touched up some areas, dry brushing with white, um, to really make areas pop. And then, uh, filtered through my airbrush, these speed paints. Um, first off, there are so many paints in that set. 
It's a huge. There box. are yeah. so many different colors. Yeah. It is uh, it's like two hundred something like that. Love the dropper yeah. bottles. Nice. Every yeah. dropper bottle yeah. comes with a bead in it. So oh, easy agitation. So you're just shaking it, and nice. it's it's so nice. I painted these things up so quickly. Like the majority of the time was taken dry brushing. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it, yeah, it really <laughs> took hardly. And then and then you know I had to go in by hand and and do some detail work on like the trees have vines and stuff yeah, going around yeah. and I did that and then I were you still using the speed paints for the handwork <clears throat> hand I was not work? because they're a little thin okay. for, for the handwork so yeah. I did some actual uh citadel like base coat paints on that yeah okay. but then I filtered a green a darker green uh uh speed paint through the airbrush again to go over those and have the green kind of I didn't mind that there was overspray a bit yeah. because it kind of looks Makes it's sense. It's organic and, and natural. And, yeah, and exactly. And shades, shades what you'd had hand painted. Exactly. Also. Yeah, nice. And uh, listen, I mean, it it's, great. it's not, com- I showed it to you yeah. earlier. It's it's not complicated terrain, um, but it adds so much just to do it. Terrain is, terrain is really fun to paint. I yeah. Mean, especially yeah. if you're, you know, rocking an airbrush. And, and previously I was using inks through this. I think speed paints have taken probably most of the ink nice. work yeah. away as well. It's so much more variety of colors. Yeah. It is a great set. Uh, we're going to get Kat and other representatives from Army Painter on to talk a little bit more about that as well. Not this episode, but in the very, very near future. It's been a long time coming, actually. But this is the first, like, I really delved into a project with them. Yeah. I am looking forward to using them for the models for Osborne as well. Yeah. Um, because <clears throat> some of those are great. I only have to paint four because of the four we're using. Yeah. The problem is when you're that game to sidetrack a little bit, that game, like Jody made a comment about Aaliyah won't play it because all the stuff isn't painted up. But the thing is you're not supposed to open the boxes until you're told to. So you get surprised. You don't by know what the creatures you, yeah. are. Yeah. yeah. So you can't pre paint. You could, but it kind of spoils some of the fun. Yeah. You know, so I'd rather... You could have somebody else paint it all for you so you get the surprise. There you but, go. Yeah. So I'm not paying for that right now. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> now while I'm out of work. So uh, very much, it was very pleasant to work through those paints and to go, wow, you know, I'd really like... I wish there was a darker green. Oh, there is a darker green. <laughs> you know? Oh, I really wish there was... What brown should I... Hey, this brown looks great. There's you know, the, yeah. it was like... There was so many flavors of colors in that set. I, I, I'm... You know, one thing I'm looking at is how do I store all my paints because I've uh, I've kind of reached a saturation point here. You got you got and, a lot of a lot of colors, and and a lot of them don't get used for a long time and then spoil. Yeah, especially yep. Games Workshop paints. Yep. I mean, the pots are fine, but honestly, it sometimes the air gets in those and yeah, they spoil. Yeah. Uh, and so. You know, as I was going through cleaning out a bunch of paints, I'm like, well, this one's no good anymore. <laughs> you know, and I probably threw away $100 worth of paints that I dried out. Because they dried out. Yeah, yeah. You know, which is unfortunate. I don't want to get into the whole dropper bottle versus thing. You know, look, we've had that conversation forever, too. I think we all agree the droppers are better. There's a reason pretty much every <clears throat> company has moved towards dropper bottles. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, cool. But, man, these speed paint things, I'm a real con- convert. Nice. I'm yeah. a real convert. I, I'm looking forward to taking them for a test drive. Yeah. yeah. I've also spent some time setting up my 3D printer for my resin 3D printer. My whole station is now set up out there. Uh, I'm still chickening out on printing something. So now that you're here and you have the same one I have, yeah. before you leave yeah, today, I'm going to have you yeah. show me like, okay, because I'm going to walk you through what I think I'm supposed to be doing just to make sure it's the right thing. Yeah, perfect. I don't think you could screw it up to the point where it's like expensive or something, but it's like, I don't want to, you know, Compared to a PLA printer, there is more of a learning curve working yeah. with resin, and it's just, it's messier. So. And I've watched a bunch of yeah, videos yeah, and, but, and whatnot. But, but the results are incredible. So, But like anything, you know, when you don't know it, you're a little intimidated by it. Yeah. And so I think once I get started, I'll be like, yeah, I'm good. You know, got it. So anyway, there you go. What about you? Nice. Yeah. Um, speaking of 3D printing, um, <laughs> I actually did some 3D prints for Brian because uh, he's doing a Zone Mortalis basing mm-hmm. for his um, Black Legion and World Leaders armies, but he's using the the GW plastic Zone Mortalis yes. base, but they don't come in the larger sizes. No, so they, they do. I not. think they max out at 40 millimeters. I yeah. think it's as large as they go. Um, so I, uh, printed- I think they're also hard to find now. Like unless he already bought them, they're hard to find. Yeah, because I think they did a rerun of some of them, but. Yeah, they're not commonly available. Yeah, yeah. 
and there's so many more base sizes than are accommodated for in that box. Um, so he he found files for it and uh, just sent me the links for them, which they were they were free free files. But I uh, resin printed. They're ba- essentially base toppers because right. they're a little bit thinner profile. So he just put them on top of mm-hmm. the bases that came with the models. But now they will match this basing style Close enough, of the rest yeah. of his army. Yeah, yeah very similar, um, which was cool. Um, and then I, I'm working on a corrupted warlord Titan, which I'd mentioned in the last episode. Yeah. And I've you made done, some progress. I've done a little bit more work to it. I, uh, I attached the heads that I got one from you one from Joe. Are those the heads we gave you? Yeah. It yeah. Looks good. Which, so I got two Lord of change heads kind of doing a twin <laughs> head thing. I've got, I can't believe the scale works so well. Oh, it's perfect. Yeah. That the, looks great. <laughs> Uh, I've got some old, old demon prince model bits uh, as kind of extraneous vents and things like that. Yeah. Um, one thing I did is I, I've got all the Forge World um, kind of extra options for weapons for Titanicus, and but I haven't built or painted a, a lot of them. I was going to do it all as a batch, but it's like this guy, I really want to do the conversion beamer. So I put together that, which was actually really fun to work with. Uh, it's it's a cool thing because the way it is, it's actually hollow in the middle. So it's oh, a it? bunch of pieces that wrap around and then it's got this kind of central core that you uh, attach things to and then stick on. It's just, it's a very Martian laser gun. Yeah. Space Ray. Uh, but at that scale, is <laughs> it's really cool and it should be fun. So this is going to be kind of a, a long range uh, possessed Titan that's going to sit back and unleash chaos. Uh, and I'm getting that ready again for the event that we're going to next month. So I've got it fully built. Um, one thing I also did was some 3D printing work for this one because instead of... Um, it one of the the corrupted rules I'm using for it are the the kind of warp conduit rules, which partially is why it's got demon heads for its its head, but also um, getting more of that kind of just uh, Empyrean warp vibe going around mm-hmm. it. So I've got some of these spirit host kits, which I um, cut out, and those are Age of Sigmar like um, spirit. Oh yeah, yeah. Models, which yeah. I'm kind of gonna be interspersing around this model, and then uh, a 3D printed <clears throat> additional one, so I can have a bunch of these popping out all over the model. So it's really gonna look like it's just kind of surrounded by. It's interesting spirits and things. as you have the longer you've played this game, mm-hmm. uh, the the more conversion you're now doing. Like, is you're getting kind of to the end of your mana pools yeah, yeah. and your your selections here. You're like, oh, I'm going to go just nuts on let's this just have it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I have five Reavers, so the fifth one was like, let's go full yeah. on with the uh, the full Corrupted. And I also, like, my my Legio isn't a fully, you know, like, Chaos Corrupted Legio. Right. Um, but well, <laughs> you look at this guy, you're like, yeah, it is. But they, like, they're on Prospero. They've been, uh, they are kind of the sister Legio to the Thousand Suns. Right. So there's a lot of influence there. And they, like, later in... 40k lore were found to be not traitorous they uh, just happened to be in the the wrong place at the wrong time but what they (laughs) they were guilty of was a lot of like kind of xenos archaeotech stuff Mm -hmm. so they were definitely delving into dark age technology stuff and kind of pushing things further and playing with some xenos tech and things like that so i've incorporated that with kind of zinchin's influence and xenos tech into the corrupted titans and i've i've been there's, there's only really one way or another to play them in Titanicus. Right, right. You're the traitors or, or you're the loyalists <laughs> or Black Shields if you want to do that, but right. that's different. Not, uh, not Chaos Tainted. Yeah, huh? not, no, it's not. Not Chaos <laughs> Tainted. It's uh, <laughs> just bird friendly. Just, just blessed by Zine. <laughs> Yeah. So, anyways, it's it's been really fun doing that, and uh, it's coming together well. It's ready for painting. Yeah, so it looks like it. Hopefully, next episode I'll uh, have some finished progress to report for that one and um i've also just done a little bit of 3d painting for some uh D models for nice. a campaign that jody and matt are running nice nice yeah. all right uh games played neither of us has played 40k recently yeah uh i spent i also forgot to mention i spent a bunch of time gathering up uh doug's uh, uh board games and stuff and looking evaluating you know making sure they had all the pieces blah 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 because i'm putting all that stuff up for sale so yeah. that's going up um, but he has a copy of, uh, oh, it's, I have a copy of it too. Forbidden stars. Uh huh. Yeah. I looked that thing up. That thing sells for a ton right now, like 250 bucks. Wow. I mean, <laughs> this is a fantasy flight game. Yep. Unfortunately, there's not going to be expansions to it because it was, a, it's a great game. It's a great game, but, and I knew it was one of his favorites. So, but, uh, you and I've been <laughs> playing RPGs yeah. a, a bunch. I actually just play just so we have something <laughs> we can say we've actually been doing things. 
Um, if you're a fan of Blade Runner, uh, Free League Publishing came out with a Blade Runner game, and Travis is running a group of us through like the introductory scenario, uh-huh. which, by the way, as far as introductory scenarios go, is like really well done. Nice. I mean, the the amount of support you get for their starter set is incredible. Um, you know, you have like, oh, here's. Oh, we, we, you know, we go to this murder scene or whatever, right? And uh, here, I don't want to do any spoilers, but okay, here's a picture from the security camera of the murder scene. Oh, well, uh, I want to enhance that. <laughs> right, enhance. Beep. Yeah. And uh, you um, you make a roll on, you know, your appropriate skill. And then, okay, here's another picture. But here's this one's close. This one's closer yeah. up. And you can see, oh, look, you know, here's, find, here's find what's going on. So, I mean, that. it l- actually has you know, that's detail that's, like that. Yeah. But more than that, the game is really interesting. So anyway, if you're a fan of Blade Runner and you're a fan of role-playing games, I'd highly recommend checking this out. Such a cool setting. It plays it too. It plays in. Yeah. And I went and watched 2049 again just before playing. So I was like super into it, but um, it plays in such a way that you have like four shifts throughout the day. So there's four of us playing and let me just describe this. There's four players, uh, not including Travis who's running. And, um, two of them are humans, two of them are Nexus nine working for replicants. the police department, replicants working for the police department. And, um, you have four shifts throughout the day. You have like the morning shift, the day shift, the evening shift and the night shift, right? Every, <clears throat> you have to rest one of those shifts. Otherwise you incur stress and stress is one of these things that is tracked through the game, especially for the Nexus units because the, the replicants, because if they get far from their baseline testing because they're stressed, then you, they'll just put you down. Yep. That's so bullet to the brain. Yeah. So um, what's interesting is, you know, you get all these clues at the beginning. Oh, here's what's happened and blah, blah, blah. And here's all these avenues of investigation. And you're like, well, there's a lot of pressure to complete this quickly. Um, We actually have to split up. And normally in role playing mm. games, you're like, don't split up the party yeah. here. You're like, for us to do all this in because accomplish it, because you go to a scene and you do the scene and that's your shift. And so now you're on to the second shift and it's like, oh, okay. Oh, neat. You, you have a real timetable yeah. associated with it. It's really kind of very cool. Nice. Yeah, it's it's a very interesting, um, it's a very interesting setting. Um, the setting's phenomenal, but the, it's a very interesting rule system that really does support the setting. But, but anyway, enough about role-playing games. And then um, <laughs> we started playing, what were we playing? Wildlands. Ca- Call of Duty Wildlands. Yeah. No. Call of Duty? No. No, it's uh, Ghost Recon Ghost Wild Recon. Man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which Doug and I had played through before. Uh, Cheyenne and Campos had played a little bit with us. But um, it's a terrible single-player game. But at multiplayer, it's the best it's thing ever. It's super fun. Yeah. yeah. It's the best <laughs> thing ever. So we're just, when we had some downtime, we were doing that instead of painting like we should be. Yeah. Yeah. So what are you going to do? Uh, so anyway, yeah, not a whole lot of hobby progress here. Yeah. Um, I think that's it. I think that's all we got. To I talk think about. that's it. All right. Yep. So let's do this. We're going to take a short break. We're going to come back and then we're going to talk. We're going to leap into the main part of the show. And the main part of the show is probably going to take a little while for us to go through. So, um, so sit tight. We'll be right back. Welcome back to episode 225 of the Independent Characters. And uh, now we're going to leap into main topic of the show again. That's kind of the state of the galaxy. Or what was your AKA? Story time with Papa Story Tuttle. Story time with Papa Tuttle. Uh-oh, I scrolled down my notes too far. Um, so, yeah, as I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, these are kind of broad swaths. I don't want to focus on, oh, but Dante did this at this point. I, I'll, I'll touch on some of those things, you know, but Mephiston did that. You know, okay. I know, you know, there's a whole, like, you will never satisfy everybody if you start talking about detail because they'll say, yeah. but you didn't mention <laughs> that Abaddon got his toenails clipped. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are a hundred plus <clears throat> books for a reason. Like the lore is so deep and there's so much in there and there's certain stories take those avenues so deep that, yeah. that yeah. The, the best way to get those detailed close up views is to read it in its natural state. But uh, we'll give you a nice overview. Yeah, so there's really two initial things here that happen, uh, kind of late 6th, early 7th, that start to kind of 
open the door, I think, to, hey, um, some changes are, are coming. Um, and, I, and I think this is these two are GW kind of dipping its toe in and saying, oh, we're going to do this. Um, it's a new army, but here's, you know, historically it's always been there, but here's where it stands now. And so we add a bunch of information about what's going on. Now, again, this hasn't really changed <clears throat> the storyline and setting forward, but you can see this is kind of some of these initial changes. And the first one is Imperial Knights. Yep. So Imperial Knights come out and then they come out as their own army, right? And for people who at that time, like myself, who had never played Epic, well, I didn't know what Imperial you Knights were. Out. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Soon I'll be able to play what? Legions and Imperials. <laughs> yeah, not again, not doing it. So that's what I keep saying. <laughs> yeah, you will. <laughs> um and so Imperial Knights come out. Uh a lot of people weren't aware that these were previously in the lore, but they come out with a supported massive book about them, uh, which is rare to get, by the way. And thank you, Dave Taylor, for giving me a copy of it. It was very I thought he loaned it to me. I went to give it back to him, and he's like, "No, oh, I gave this to you. Oh, him. nice. Yeah. Like, oh, wow. <laughs> oh, Thank sweet. you, Dave. <laughs> so um, it's super cool. But also, uh, you know, a small kind of splat book comes out about him, but then later a codex comes out right. about him. And I think this is significant in the sense that, first off, I think it was 6th, 7th edition where they first introduced Lords of War as a army slot. Yeah, that sounds right. Which people were super resistant to. I mean, you got to remember before, like, you were not allowed to play with things like Bane Blades or Knights or Titans. Outside of Apocalypse. Outside of Apocalypse. Yeah. And so, all of a sudden, there's, like, this shift in kind of the scale of the game a little bit mm -hmm. as they kind of up, up level some of these things. And whether that's good or bad, you know, at the time, I mean, with any, <laughs> with any new army, you know, oh, I, I have this knight army and people refuse to play me. I'm like, okay, you know. I mean, yeah, they were, they were tough, right? I was starting it, game. I'll, I'll be honest. It's not my favorite experience. Not mine either, but, um, you know, I mean, I'm not going to begrudge somebody wanting to play with the toys they, they yeah, brought. Absolutely. Um, what's interesting, just a quick tangent here yeah. is, um, age of Sigmar is yeah. very much like mass battles with kind of one big thing. Right. And I think this is about the same time frame that 40K started introducing the Lord of War slot. There, it is, which is, absolutely. Kind of a similar just uh, approach to Hey, we want design. some big monsters yeah. on the yeah. table, right? To kind of, and it does look cool. Yeah. I mean, I'm yeah, not going to argue that. And it sets up a lot of future stuff, which we will talk right. about. Right, so this is 2000, March of 2014 that the Knights get released. And I'm like, everybody was kind of excited about it That's, to the point yeah, where. Cool kits. Yeah, I mean, they're cool kits. You know, they're expensive, but. You know, people were pretty jazzed about it overall. Again, how they played, people were... This is always the case, though. Yeah. This yeah. is always the case. <laughs> the other thing that got introduced a little bit later were Adeptus Custodes mm -hmm. into 40K. Now, at this time, the Horus Heresy line is going real strong. Yeah. Like, real strong. Yeah. We're fully invested in it. Adeptus Custodes are introduced into 30K and quickly into 40k afterwards, you know, a plastic sets come out for some of these, which can be used bilaterally. I mean, they can be used unilaterally, I guess is the word I'm looking for. Maybe. Anyway, they, they can be used to, in, in both. 10,000 years. In both. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, now, this is also a, a kind of change forward too, because up until this point, the Adeptus Custodes in the lore are the guardians of the emperor. They do not leave Terra. They do not really go outside of the imperial palace for the most part right yeah other than some very special missions but now all of a yeah. sudden they're everywhere well okay yeah they are everywhere because <laughs> there's more of them than there are gray knights because <laughs> they're yeah who are supposed to be the elite of the elite right. the, the, the elite these are the elite of the elite the elite of the elite, elite. leader <laughs> and so you have very small armies which appeals to some people who don't want to paint a lot of stuff yeah yeah um Again, their vehicle support is really very limited. Very limited. It's based out of out of Forge World primarily. Later, they get like a land raider outed to it as like the Talons of the Emperor set comes out. Sisters of Silence are kind of part of this as well. <clears throat> but the interesting thing here is that you now say 
Well, the custodies sometimes are going out on these ranging forces or joining other forces or whatever. Um, again, people don't really like to play against these initially. They're yeah. really tough. They're very tough to beat. I mean, the thing to remember is as you start killing them, their efficacy drops tremendously, right? Because right? Right. they're so elite. Um, but that being said, uh, I, I see these two shifts, these two releases as kind of a shift forward where they're now making kind of exceptions or bringing things that from the past that hadn't been brought forward. Now they're bringing them forward more and saying, oh, no, actually these things, these knights have been around all the time. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but this kind of lays the foundation, I think, for some significant changes that come um, further. Because as we get towards the end of 7th edition, which is just this mishmash of... <laughs> <laughs> allied forces and, yeah. and and changes and ways to play air battles and ways to play just tank battles and strongholds and fortifications and it's kind of a hot mess of options it's a hot mess yeah and i mean you would think an unlimited number you know like a tremendous amount of options is a good thing as it turns out it, it is but man it makes it hard to manage and i think games workshop realized this is why ninth edition kind of went down the same route towards yeah, the end. I'm like, yeah. what are you doing? You're repeating the all same mistakes. All the supplements mistakes. are back. Yeah, all that. yeah, that you did in 7th edition. Because um, those complaints we heard towards the end of ninth edition, which were, I have to bring five books to play, blah, blah. Listen, yep. if you played in 7th edition, <laughs> you heard that Been too. there before. It was, and I would argue it was actually even worse in 7th. I think they, yeah. they pulled the plug a little quicker this time than they did in 7th edition. Um Boy, 8th edition was refreshing after seven. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> um, so, but to wrap up 7th edition, you have The Gathering Storm. A series of three books, which people likened to kind of the fantasy the end, end times. times. Yep. Yeah. So at that time, uh, fantasy had, had switched to Age of Sigma. And to do so, they had the they, end times. That blew up the old world. Which was a series of five books. Um, they're pretty big actually. Yeah. And kind of have these ultimate battles and things happen. And yes, in the end, really the galaxy's kind of the no, universe is destroyed. The realm shatters into a bunch of different and is recreated spheres. in different yeah. 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 So um so as this as Fall of Cadia or excuse me, as the Gathering Storm was coming out, I remember a lot of conversations of people saying, Oh, this is the end times for 40k. Yep. Uh well. Yes and no. I mean, more no than yes. Correct. More no than yes. <laughs> yeah. We did switch game systems. Like 8th edition was a significant departure mechanically. Yep. Uh, yeah, full reset back to indexes, or I guess the first indexes that we had seen at that point because it was a, a hard reset. Like yep. every every book was null and void at that point. Yeah. Whereas typically what would happen is a new edition would come out, your book was still valid with the new yes. edition. But now you had a whole different system. You had uh, fixed to hit uh, rolls. Um, so there was no longer what's your weapon skill versus my weapon right, skill yeah. tables. The it comparison was just like, charts. Yeah, there was a huge amount of change there. Strength and toughness were <laughs> simplified yeah, to, to what they bit. are now, which is very similar to what they are today still. The but. game was, I would say, um, streamlined. And simplified in some ways. You no longer had facing on vehicles. Correct, right. Which you yeah. had had in all previous editions. Armor facing or the armor penetration rules. Right. Yeah. Oh, right. Armor <laughs> Templates, guest I forgot ranges. About armor. There was a lot. A but, whole bunch yeah, changes. Yeah. So the previous rules you had were no longer eligible. But to lead into this, you have the Gathering Storm. And what Games Workshop decides to do is release three books. And over those three books, they begin to advance the 40K storyline kind of ushering in this new change was that necessary really for the first time in 30 years too yeah, yeah ever i mean well yeah not ever but really since the 40k had been as established the 41st minute only had been established as a timeline this is kind of the first major move forward i mean was that necessary i don't i don't know if it was or wasn't but here we are yeah um yeah, so the first book that comes out for this series, and they're not released all at once, they're released over a period of time. It's called The Fall of Cadia. And The Fall of Cadia 
is um, some boring ass reading. <laughs> I'm just going <laughs> to tell you right now. We, when this was coming out, we said, we're going to cover each book as it comes out. We yeah. covered the first one and we were like, nope, we are not doing two and three. And boy, I'm glad we didn't do two because boy, if I thought the first one was dull, the second one was way worse. <laughs> Uh, but the first one, The Fall of Cadia, so uh, is really Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade. So let's talk about Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade, because yeah. for those who don't know, back in 4th edition, uh, <clears throat> Games Workshop run, ran uh, uh, the Eye of Terror campaign. Correct. And the Eye of Terror campaign was Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade. Uh, it was played globally. It was one of these global things. Uh, you would submit the games that you played to Games Workshop. Whether these games were actually played or not, there was no real kind of judging on that. But I believe, if unless I'm mistaken, Chaos had like a tremendous victory to the point where like Eldrad is slain. Right, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, pretty much Chaos kind of runs rampant over everything. Um, and Games Workshop was like, well, wait a minute. Because originally they had said, we we're going to take the results of this and work it into the lore. And then I think it went so far against what they were anticipating. More extremely than to the point where it would affect model sales and armies and right. how they play and things like that. They were like, we yeah. think we've made a mistake here. <laughs> and, you know, and they caught a lot of grief for that. Yeah. Like they caught a lot of grief for rolling that back. But I actually, I understand. It disappoints me too, especially as a chaos player. But I understand. I think this plays a little bit of homage to that, though. Yeah. Because the fall of Cadia, Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade, you have Blackstone fortresses that he has under his control. They retcon kind of all of what Abaddon's crusades were. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, that They were all really... They weren't failures. They were setting specific things up. Each one for had a this specific one. task. He was like trying to get this weapon, yeah. trying to get building his foundation yeah. for this ultimate. It's all a big yeah, plan. Yeah, yeah. Which again, Games Workshop caught a lot of grief for, but I think it tells a better story Absolutely. and it makes a lot more yeah. sense that this guy who's supposed to be this complete nut job of a of an evil guy doesn't just get his butt kicked at twelve times. Right. You yeah. know, he he's orchestrating and planning towards something. He's not just twirling his mustache and saying, I'll get you next time. If he was, they just kill him off. He's clearly ineffective. So um, so in this book, the end result here, there's a number of factors that come into play. Necrons are, you know, one Necron in particular, the um, Uh, the collector guy. Yeah, Trazen. Trazen the Infinite is kind of cruising around. You've got Grayfax and Inquisitor uh kind of on the planet and you know it's funny actually that justin hill was called out earlier he write he wrote a book about this where you get and we talked about this recently where you get a ground's eye view of what that battle looked like which is very different when you're reading like a like when i read this book in the gathering storm series i was like okay you know it's it was okay (laughs) and that was more broad strokes right yeah pulled back yeah it's pulled back like a history book but when you see it from somebody on the ground eye view it's it's a very different experience uh ultimately cadia which is this fortress world where the cadians come from uh and cadians are really really like they get a lot of grief that everybody looks like cadians cadian and if you're cadian like the minute you can hold a rifle it 10 11 years old here's your rifle we start training you yeah like these guys are are hardcore um aaron divsky bowden wrote a book called katie and blood and those guys are awesome in it like he does a great job of pumping them up as like these really elite soldiers uh for humans for humans uh katia has sat kind of defending um the eye of terror right and and the Imperium from the Eye of Terror, the along first with first line of defense, yeah, along with other planets. But Cadia is really the kind of center of this um, for centuries, for for thousands of years yeah. now. Yeah, and uh, at the end of this book, Cadia finally falls. Um, that is a tremendous step forward. That's yeah, huge <laughs> in this series. Um, and what they do is, and I don't know if this was always kind of the plan because I hadn't heard about this before, but it, it may have been there, was there were these um, Blackstone pylons all sprinkled throughout Cadia's crust. Yeah. Things that the Blackstone fortresses are made of. And then it turns out like these things uh, 
are holding back the warp yeah. from from releasing itself into reality. And so at the end, basically, Abaddon throws one of these Blackstone Fortresses at Cadia, um, cracking Cadia in half and destroying it. Um, and Cadia falls. And because of that, we now have the Cicatrix Maledictum. Yeah. Right? And, Chaos and the rips eye of terror free. just ripping. Yeah, rips open and rips the galaxy in half. Yeah. Okay, so this is such a major, like, it's so funny when people are still like, well, Abaddon hasn't accomplished anything. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> he just ripped the galaxy. He, half. he effectively defeated half of the Imperium with this move. Yeah. Um, and, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But basically, you now have what had always been the focus of chaos was the Eye of Terror. And there were other areas that chaos could encroach out of like smaller warp rifts. Yeah, yeah. Now you've literally stripped the galaxy in half and everything on that other side is nigh unreachable. Right. And um, what's fascinating about that too, and, and I think they haven't explored it enough yet, is that there are some significant space marine chapters on the other side of that. Right, yeah. Like core space marine chapters, Blood Angels, Ball is on the other side of that, you know, rift it's like what's, what's what are, going on what with the blood doing? angels yeah. <laughs> you know uh and and we haven't really explored a lot of that we're kind of starting to with because it's, it's interesting we'll right because and i guess we can we can save that but um just the imperium nihilus is the the other side the dark side of the warp um and what's interesting there is the like, the light of the Astronomicon does not reach over there. Right. Like, so there is no warp travel. There's no communication. <laughs> like all these systems are completely cut off. It's almost like um, old night. Yeah. 2.0. Yeah. 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 And there's a couple corridors through this thing, but I think in spirit of the em spirit of the emperor, mm -hmm. um, Aaron writes a really good explanation of just how difficult that is to actually even true. Yes. It's possible to get through there. Yeah. It's not still, it's not a good trip. Not like you're going to lose a lot of ships yeah. going through there. So, yeah. um, that's crossing the, uh, the, the, the rift itself. itself. Yeah. 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 Um, so this is a massive change. Like this is a massive yeah. <laughs> change. And, and when this occurs, like we're still in seventh edition. So like, cause this is the first book, right? Yep. It's unfortunate that the write up to that was so mundane because because it's such a cool advancement it is a cool advancement um and and it's honestly the one advancement that i was like it, it's so funny because at first blush when it happens i was like that's really dumb <laughs> and then as more like i was like how it felt kind of lazy oh well you know we're but then as right talented writers began to write about it I began to see the potential for right. some great yeah. storytelling. I yeah. mean, like, you know, I'd never thought of the 40 K universe as like post apocalyptic, but it kind of is, it, but yeah. it isn't. Yeah. But then you look at the other side of the, and I'm always like a huge post apocalyptic fan. The other side, the Imperium Nihilus, Nihilus like that is post apocalyptic. Yeah, absolutely. People are scrounging for supplies to stay alive and yep. doing whatever they have to do. It's fascinating. The the uh, you don't you don't have the imperial tithe anymore because there's no imperium. <laughs> that no. no no imperial presence over there. Loyalist but, space marines are now turning into renegade space yeah, marines because they're like, well, you have no support, you have no warp travel, no communication. Like you have your system and you, have, you can only you really travel warp travel. You in to, system. Yeah. And you can travel outside, but you got to be real short hops and yeah. like yeah, it's, and it's dangerous. And it's very dangerous, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of fascinating potential for stuff on that side that I, I think GW still has not explored enough. So, anyway, the other aspect that happens here is the introduction of Belisarius Call. Yeah. This is a... Game changer. Game changer. You have a new character added to the game as well, but a character that has such massive ramifications... Uh, to the lore. Yeah. Yeah. And in particular, his, um, you know, he's present on Cadia for, for a short period of time. He, he is ultimately responsible for um, 
we'll get into it in a little bit, but the introduction of the Primaris Marines yep. into, into 40K lore. Uh, but uh, he is kind of led around by some of the Eldar uh, as the Eldar um, get into the second book, The Fracture of Beel Tan. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> if you thought the first book was dull, <laughs> <laughs> this one was confusing, I, th- I felt. And and just it just wasn't the best of, of writing. And it w- and the unfortunate thing for me here was like I was going from Forge World Imperial Armor books that are written in such a different yeah. tone yeah. to this, which is much more comic booky, but not even that. It was just um It's a little more pulp and shallow at the same time. And that the pacing is not good of yeah. the stories, and it's just kind of like here's what's going on, um, and it's difficult. I mean, it's difficult for them to write the direction that this is headed. You know, it's funny. I get so much grief for for liking everything. I did not like this series of books, um, which made it, Jeff and, loved it though. <laughs> <laughs> which also made it hard for me to appreciate the changes because I think the changes are not necessarily bad. Yeah. But the writing and, and the, the way in which it rolled out did not work for me. Um, Fracture of Biltan introduces now an entirely new faction of Eldar. And in fact, now we're also moving away. And this is where I'm going to touch too. You start to see name changes to factions. Yes. Imperial Guard are no longer Imperial Guard. Now they're uh, Astra Militarum. Astra Militarum. The Eldar become the Aldari, right? And while they try to kind of retcon some of this, right? Well, they've always been the Astra Militarum, right? But Imperial Guard is kind of just the layman's yeah, term. The logo. And, and I'm, I'm cool with that. Yeah. You know, I'm cool with that. Um, but the reason they really kind of double down on this is because around this time, for those who aren't aware, there was a lawsuit that Games Workshop was involved in with a this third party company. Yeah. I don't remember what chapter house, chapter house yeah. miniatures. Yeah. And this goes to court and uh, games workshop has to defend what's unique about the right Warhammer fantasy. Yeah. What's unique about 40 K uh, their argument was, well, really it focuses on chaos. Like chaos is this thing that nobody else really kind of does. And it's our unique thing. And so you have like stuff like this is why, Age of Sigmar comes about, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's a right? huge, huge one. You had, <laughs> you had the, um, what were the knights? The uh, Bretonians. The Bretonians. It's like. They're just European knights. They're just yeah. European knights, yeah. you know. Why you can't really IP defend guys in on horses with lances. <laughs> you know, it's right. like, it's yeah. a thing. <laughs> um, so this leads to a lot of where we are now. And I, I mean, I will, I mean, to kind of sidetrack here for a second, but I remember people were just cheering on chapter house miniature, oh, stick it to the big guy. They've been screwing everybody, you know, with their IP lawyers and blah, blah. And you know what? They're pretty aggressive with their, their IP yeah, lawyers yeah. At, at certain points. I'm this not, was also previous iteration management of games. Yeah, whole new yeah. management now. Very different from how things are publicly but faced. People today. were just cheering on yeah. uh, David, the, Defying Goliath. And then when Goliath says, okay, fine. Now we have to make these changes. Everybody, and people and everybody, <laughs> everybody gets real about upset yeah. about that. It's like, well, what, yeah. what we're a company, and I'm not trying to defend Games Workshop, but like I understand the thinking. We're a company, we're trying to make money, we're trying to sell models. If you're encroaching on that, we have to defend ourselves. I mean, that's just IP. Yeah. You know, and and if we're not well, then we got to make changes. Oh, you don't like those changes? Well, that upsets us because we want you to like the changes because we want you to buy the models, right? right? Yeah, like, yeah. It, they're trying to find a solution. And uh, a big part to, of where it stemmed from was there was models in codexes or units in codexes that Games Workshop had not yet released models correct. for. Like the like Tyranid Drop Pod. Thunderwolf Cavalry was Thunderwolf a big Cal- one of that. Like, a, yeah. kind of a, a very uh, iconic unit for... Space wolves that didn't exist model wise, so somebody else so came what up you with an option, it? yeah, and they were wildly popular. And yeah, that was yeah. a problem. Yeah, um, Mr. Dandy, 
from uh, they used to advertise with us had some great, <laughs> great yeah. models like the Thunderwolf calf that were fantastic. So anyway, fracture of Beal Tan <clears throat> deals with um, you know uh, the emissary of you need. Um, it has basically a whole Eldar god kind of coming back into being. And, yeah, and. It's an interesting concept because this is uh, Eldrad kind of had the plan, right? With the soul stones right. of like, if every Eldar dies, then we can kind of re re summon you need. Yeah, and um, this and this will be the god to actually kill Slanesh. Right. So that Eldar will be free going forward, even if they're all physically dead, their spirits will be free going forward, which right. conceptually is. What they'd want. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a really so cool you concept. have uh, a three pack of characters that get introduced. Uh, you have Rain being one of them, the emissary of you need. Um, but there's this whole, like, and I just didn't find it fascinating. Like, there's this whole backstory of her where she's fighting in the pits of Kamara and, you know, and then she defeats all these people and yada, yada. And it, it, it kind of, it just kind of went on and on. I was, I was just like, I, I'm having a hard yeah, time making yeah. my way through this story. Um, you need represents the hope for the dwindling Eldar race, as you just said, which I think that the plan for the me concepts was really cool. interesting. Like if every Eldar dies and all those soul stones combine and basically form this God that can defeat Slanesh and like free the souls of this entire race. that has been persecuted since the birth of Slanesh. Like that is awesome. Like that's a cool concept, which is unfortunate that it's less, less exciting on how it unfolds. Right. And then uh, you have the Yen Carney which is the avatar of the newly awakened God of you need. Yeah. Anyway, you get, you get some new models for, for Eldar, which hadn't had models in forever. Right. Yeah. At yeah. this point, um, they're vastly different. And what they end up doing is kind of making this Eldar faction. That's kind of combining a bunch of Eldar factions, including, uh, Harlequin, Harlequin, Kari. Yep. The Yanari and then uh, craft world and craft world yeah. are all kind of crammed into one list. And you kind of get the sense that they're like... And it's real different from how it plays. Yeah, it's super different. <laughs> it's super different. Oh, very thematic on things dying and <clears throat> units being able to move and things like that. But it's uh, it's it's different. Yeah. Um, but story-wise, again, like we see this huge advance. Now this is for the Eldar who... It's it's interesting. Now that I, like, now that I have future knowledge and I think back to it, um, it's kind of the only direction they could go with the Eldar. Right? Like, I mean, right. the Eldar are never going to be a resurgent race. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's the whole point, is that they're they're long-lived, but long gestation period to bring new Eldar to bear, and they're dying off, and their souls are getting consumed. Like, where do you go from that? It's not like, oh, we and found this pond, and we all can drink from it, and now we're, like, super fertile. <laughs> you know <what laughs> just, I mean? just making babies. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, you know, another direction that you would go that doesn't, like this kind of fatalistic, like we're all going to die, but we'll be free once we're dead right. is actually kind a, of cool. Eternally conceptually. free. Yeah. Like which, conceptually, this is very cool. It's a really neat concept. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm all about it. Yeah. Again, I don't feel like the execution of it. I don't know how you, I don't know how I would execute it better. I mean, writing the story is one thing. I'm not super hot on like where they go with the Eldar here or the Eldari here. Um, and and this is probably the old guy in me talking where I'm just like, I really like the Eldar as yeah, how yeah. they were, you know. Um, but Games Workshop felt they needed to move them forward. And they needed to move them forward because working with the Eldar, you have um, the third book, Rise of the Primarch. And this is the one that sends everybody kind of over the edge <laughs> because now you have the return of Rebute Gilliman. Yep. Um, first Primark to return first loyalist Primark to return. Um, and it's so funny because like they make a big deal about him returning. The model comes out. Yeah. Uh, the model with the helmet looks great. Yeah. Yeah. It does. <laughs> I, I don't think the face on the, hel uh, the unhelmeted one looks particularly good, but I think it's a good model. I mean, it's, it's incredibly elaborate. It's got a lot of presence. looks great on a tabletop. It's big. It's, it's big, a, yeah. it's a Lord of war. It's a Lord of war. Um, 
so the way he comes back into being is basically the Eldar say, hey, we have a solution to bring him back. Now, he has been kept in stasis since being poisoned thousands of years ago and at the edge of death by Fulgrim in a battle with Fulgrim. Um, and so uh, during uh, the Ultramar campaign, Call is able to um, work on... Uh, you know, he, he, he works with the Eldar to get um, Gilman resurrected, basically raised, freed. He still has to wear, like, this suit now to keep him alive yeah. right, because of this constant poison within him. Um, but Gilman kind of comes back, I, I want to say at the end of the Bill Tan book, like, is where they really raise him. And then he he's, he's back in the third one, kind of fighting the forces of chaos and trying to make his way to Terra. Cause he's like, I gotta go, I gotta get to Terra to kind of shore up yeah. the Imperium. The Imperium is now on the verge of collapse because half the galaxy, it, half of the Imperium has been wiped out. Basically you have not only that um, we're, we're just talking about like Imperium Nihilus. Like that's the only problem. Um, <laughs> the, the, all the, all the worlds that kind of border this are now, Facing chaos incursions, yeah, alien yeah. incursions, right? I mean, um, renegades are running rampant right now because yeah. chaos can still get where they want to through right. the warp with right same relative ease they've always been able to. To that point, they, uh, they literally assault the Sol system and Terra. Yeah, like uh, I think a bunch of bloodthirsters appear on Terra. And start, you know, fighting on Terra at some point. So, I mean, look, this is like moving, <laughs> moving the needle well forward. Yeah. And and the, I think that the frustrating thing for uh, purists of 40K at that point was, look, if you were saying we were at one minute to midnight or whatever, what, now what, we're 30 seconds? 30 to seconds. I, I mean, like. <laughs> 15 seconds. Um, it was it was interesting to see like where it was going. Again, I, th I think getting through the stories of these books, and I still own the books because, I mean, you know, they're kind of a historical yeah, piece yeah. of it. Um, getting through the story and the writing of it made it very difficult to appreciate kind of what they were doing, which is interesting. Like as we're talking about this, like that's kind of occurring to me. Yeah. Um, it is a, it's a neat setup. Yeah. And I didn't appreciate it for what it was yeah. at the time. So long story short, uh, Gilliman makes his way back to Terra with Belisarius call who at this point it's kind of revealed, Oh, you know what? I've been working on this Primaris project yeah. for 10,000 years that I started way back when, and these are like more advanced Marines. Um, and I've got thousands of them in stasis <laughs> ready to and they're go. from all the different. Yeah. Got all the genes chapters. Yeah. yeah. Which is interesting. Cause like, what do you do with the ones that are like from death guard and you know, that they're probably a little concerned about those. Yeah. Um, keep them on ice. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I mean, and there's concern that like the work that call has been doing is borderline heretical. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, so he, this is, this serves kind of two, two fold points here. In the lore, it shores up the Imperium a bit, right? Because the Imperium is about to be destroyed. Uh, and it shores up the Imperium to say, hey, th but there's hope. Yeah. Right. Yep. There's always a spark of hope. There's always a spark of hope. Which um, this, this reminds me of the uh, Raven Guard in, in, this is F Horus Heresy time after Istvan, like Raven Guard tried to rebuild after getting massacred and right. they actually got some of the like, genetic coding secrets were and they That's were right. essentially trying that. to make like primaris marines 10,000 years ago in order to repopulate their massacred chapter right. region at that point um but it ends up not going so well for them uh with corruptions and things like that and they obviously weren't the emperor <laughs> or they they weren't masters of the genetic components to that so there's an interesting history of somebody trying to do this and it 
not right. turning out so well. So now trying to do it on even a much broader scale for, you know, every, although with chapter. somebody who's probably a little better at yeah. it than they yeah, are. Yeah, absolutely. You know? But it, uh, it's cool. Like history repeats itself, but <clears throat> so there's hesitation, but let's see how it goes this time. It's so interesting to me though, that here you have Belisarius call. Who's a model you can play on the table. A complicated model. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. One of my issues with 40K, and I've always said this, is that, um, and, and I'll, I'm, too, I'm torn on this, this point, is that you have this massive galaxy, and yet here you have Call and Gilliman that are like, let's go solve everything. Yep. It's two people that are going to They basically. are the Imperium. <laughs> okay. Um, and I mean, I guess, you know, in history, you have people who have had such an impact you have oppenheimer yeah right yeah who changed the world and the way things happen there um yeah look how many special characters we have on our one little planet here and then i mean multiply you, that by you, a galaxy you got a good point you got some pretty good villains and you and and hopefully you have some pretty good good people but i completely see what you're going for which is a big part of why i don't play special characters in the game like yeah doug didn't like, either as just, a result of this i'd but. rather it's a huge galaxy i'd rather create my own little stories yeah. for this this captain and why he's important and i love playing uh 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 not abaddon uh armin I, I love playing him on the table but occasionally i'm like i'm gonna play without him yeah. you know like yeah. He can't, be, he can't be everywhere. Yeah. This is silly. I'm going to play with him and play on tabletop nice. and talk more about that. But um, that was what I meant. I meant to talk about that in the hobby progress section. I'll talk about it at the end of the show. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, everything hinging. I, I just feel like characters take too big of a role in things. Like when you would read Forge World books, even when they had like, named characters in those forge world books like they do some stuff over here they do some stuff. maybe they have a big battle but then it's yeah, th yeah it really is just a small part of that thing now that being said you know there was always this kind of um you know in a galaxy of millions or billions trillions you know everything can hinge on one one person one moment know. that's all it takes i i guess <laughs> <You know? laughs> I think it belittles the scale of, of what 40 K yeah, can be. Yeah. And something I actually appreciate about the forge world campaigns, the, at least the later ones they came yeah. out with, with uh, you had different war zones happening within a campaign. And if this special character was fighting in war zone, you X, use them. They couldn't be anywhere else. I really dug that, which was great. Like yeah. they, they can't, God, they can't system. be everywhere. It's a great system. It's yeah. such a good system. Yeah. came out with fall of Orpheus yep. originally. So if you can get your hands on fall of Orpheus, there's a great system in there for campaigns that you can apply to even campaigns today. I highly recommend it. It's, it's a fantastic system and they kind of iterated on it from like it first. I, I don't remember if that's where it first came out and then it moved on to like Horace Heresy. I and mean, the same people were working on it. Right. Alan yeah. Bly, yeah. Paul Rudge, you know, John French, all those guys were working on this Ed Brown. Like all those guys were working on this same, I think Andy, Andy Hoare was working on some of that, if I'm not mistaken, you know, and so they played through, oh, yeah, okay, well, you know what could be better is if we make this change, and then the next supplement would have yeah. other changes to it. It's Just a great system. Kept evolving. and um, yeah. so, so, okay, uh, so this is kind of the end of 7th edition where we get to this point where now you have, as you said, first Imperial, like, uh, Loyalist Primarch is back, but a new bunch of characters, and the whole setting has changed. Right. The whole setting has changed with, Imperium Nihilus uh, <clears throat> and the and the Great Rift. Again, I think this is hampered by some of their writing. And e even reading it in the book, you're like, okay, you know, so this has happened. The other thing that happens is you start to see, in support of the Primaris Marines, new vehicles that are using, like, better technology than ever before. Yeah. And you're like, a lot of graph technology coming back. And you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> you know. The point of the Imperium was that it was crumbling and couldn't sustain itself and was still trying to hold off, you know, everything despite the corruption and right, rot yeah. within it. Hanging on by a thread. Now all of a sudden it's like, <laughs> oh, look, we've got, you know, entire squads with plasma weapons and we've got, 
you know, flying vehicles and flying tanks. And, and it's like, okay, wait a minute, what, what happened here? And then somebody brought up to me at one point, you know, towards the end of World War II, the Germans made a lot of advancements in desperation to try to, you know, and I was like, oh, that's actually a really good point. Yeah. Like when you're funneling like every it's focus the, the last on this. hurrah. It's all or nothing at that point. Yeah. And and so, but I'm still feeling at that at this point, not right now, but then, um, that okay, you know, this feels like you've taken something really gritty and injected too much hope into it. Yeah. It's like now the Imperium's like resurgent. And and I'm like, this is kind of silly. Now, let's step back from that for a second. Because at this moment in time, too, look. The space marine models are not f- fantastic. <laughs> I mean, they're good. They're yeah. good enough. But when you compare them to the Primaris models, the Primaris models yeah, are clearly scale, better. detail, options. And I've said this on yeah. this show before because I had firsthand knowledge of it and discussion with the people involved. This was a 10-year plan yep. at this point because model technology had improved. They could scale them a little bit better and make it look more imposing. We'd move to 32 millimeter bases. Oh yeah. my God, the drama yeah. that caught. <laughs> Got to rebase all those armies. Um, which arguably they look better on 32 millimeter bases. Yep. Uh, and, you know, this was a 10 year plan to filter out the old Marines and bring in the new ones. And Games Workshop felt, one, it wasn't fair, but to the lashback, if they were to just say, by the way, these are no longer available. Here's this whole yep. new set of Marines. Here's a new line. Yep. Would, I mean, they had just dealt with with uh, the fantasy. They just just killed People fantasy. setting their <laughs> the vampires on, army. Uh, high elf army <laughs> yeah. on fire because he was all upset about this. So dumb. Uh, all upset about, you know, fantasy going away and, and Age of Sigmar beginning. Um, so they were aware of it and they're like, well, how do you do this? I mean, how do you do this? This is probably as good a plan as any, I guess, you know, um, I think a side note, some of the Primaris Marines that look better than other Primaris Marines. I think the standard like Primaris tactical squad, whatever they're called, you know, in intercessor, interrogator, interrupter, (laughs) you know, (laughs) they have so many. In, in name. Imperium starts with I. Yeah. Chaos starts with skull or blood. That's right. Uh, I think, like, the base guys look amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, some of the units, like the flying guy, I don't care about those, but now the jump pack guys are out. I'm like, hey, you know, yeah. I like those. So, yep. um, again, whatever. I'm not a Marine player, so I, I should have no skin in this game. But uh, that being said, um, this is a plan to replace these along with all these other plans of moving on to new additions and, and whatnot. Um, and it should be mentioned that also, also, I didn't mention at this point, before even the um, the uh, uh, Fracture of Biltan and, and all this, the Gathering Storm series, you have um, the Magnus makes his return. In 7th edition. Right. Uh, so this is a, I want to say two book series. I think the first one was called like something about the Wolfen. Oh, the yeah. Secret of the Wolfen or something along those books. lines. And the uh, next one was The Fury of Magnus was the next one. Um, S- Secret of the Wolfen? I think that's that, what that was it was part called. of Psychic Awakening or is it something? It was part of Psychic Awakening. Yeah, okay. And it, it was the ultimate, it was kind of the finale of psychic awakening stuff yeah. where um they assault uh the homeworld of the the uh the space wolves again right because yep. fury of magnus yep um <clears throat> it it's a story it sort of advances and when i'm talking about like advancing things i'm talking about things that have a shift to the fundamentals of 40 K introducing Magnus does so uh, in the sense that he's also a Lord of war. He's a very powerful unit to have yeah. on the table. Here's your monster unit. They bring back thousand sons as great models, right? I'm yeah, sold. Yeah. I mean, this, and I this is the it. first demon primarch we've had in rules and models. Yes. Yes. For 40 K for 40 K. And, um, 
But does it fundamentally change anything about the galaxy and everything? No, not really. Uh, I mean, you know, in the lore and whatnot, um, Magnus had kind of been around, but he didn't really show up very often. Right. Blah, blah, blah. Honestly, uh, Angron's the same way at this point. Yeah. Um, like he's, Angron's at the first battle of Armageddon, right? Um, but anyway, point being, um, it, it seems like a big thing and it is kind of a big thing, but Games Workshop and in particular with 40K have done this a lot where they're like, here's this huge event that happens, but it's like, it's like a pebble in a, in a, in, a, a, in a lake. Again, it's a giant galaxy. So, right. right here's the big thing. And for that, that action, that faction and that particular like combat action, uh, makes a big deal there, but in the grand scheme of galaxy has no real effect. Doesn't really and matter. I think that's, yeah, see, this is where I'm kind of torn on it. Like yeah. in some ways it should, but in other ways it's like, but should it? Yeah. Right. I mean, ultimately, Literally, and look, I love the Space Wolves. If the Space Wolves were wiped out, would it make a huge difference to the galaxy at large? Arguably, no. I mean, arguably, they're they're a thousand Marines. Yep. Okay. Yep. Amongst trillions, quadrillions of of people, yeah. you know. Yep. It's a drop in the bucket. Right. And and I mean, I guess in a sense, when you're playing a game, I mean, you want it to mean something, but I mean. Not everybody can save the galaxy, <laughs> right? True. Yeah. All right. So uh, anyway, so anyway, I'm, I'm I'm diverging a little bit there, but but you did have um, you did have the the uh, primarch of of the thousand suns, uh, return, um, with Warzone Fenris. That's what it's called. It was a uh, curse of of the Wolfen, and then Wrath of Magnus. There were two books, um, and uh, also, um more demon primarchs to return even further. And we'll, we'll talk about those after we take a short break. But before we take a break, I just want to kind of reemphasize that in, in this is a large change for, for Games Workshop. As, as you said, like things had not changed for 30 years. Yeah, right. 25 to 30 yeah. years. Like arguably we could say things changed between Rogue Trader and second edition and even second to third, but like those changes were never about changing was, the galaxy. Right, it was more gameplay than it was yeah. lore. And and some of that lore, yeah, it gets firmed up a little bit. I think yeah. Like yeah. in Rogue Trader, I think Marnius Calgar was like some pirate captain guy, you know, or I, there, there's some goofy. Like I don't think you could count Rogue Trader. Like in in the modern fiction of the 40k universe, I think Rogue Trader kind of was the training pants, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, you know, of what we were heading for. It was cocaine fueled eighties, <laughs> yes, you know, craziness <laughs> to, Hey, you know, we have something here, which is funny because as you go back and you look at the Eldar from that time, like they have not changed very much at all. Yep. And that's why I'm so fascinated with that lore. Like they really nailed it. Yep. Out of the starting. Yes. Jess Goodwin just nailed it. Right. And, and wrote a really fantastic fictional race. Um, you know, there's other things that changed during this period, especially around like fifth and sixth edition that we hadn't seen before. And I haven't really talked about because again, they aren't like galaxy spanning changes. Right. They, they don't really move the story forward. For example, and I, cause I don't want Necron, I don't want our Xenos pals to feel left out. But like Necrons used to just be this like soulless horde of automatons that kind of marched across and then phased out when you killed off right, enough yeah. of the army. They were they just raiders. They would just show up. They just show kill up some stuff. I mean, it, it had out. some lore that they were like awakening on these planets. Right. It's cool, but yeah. they were really just soulless killing machines. Yeah. The new Necrons came out and they gave them personality. Right. You had dynasties. Yes. They became more Egyptian kind of themed and and i actually there's some benefit to the like soulless killing thing but in a universe of multiple soulless killing things like okay you know like the tyranids this is one of my problems with playing the tyranids i never yep. get attached to like a particular tyranid or anything um i would argue like it was a good advancement it was it was a good lore change for the 
the Necrons to have these different dynasties. Yeah. And boy, if you yeah. really wanted to see a gritty one, looked at Fall of Orpheus. I mean, yeah. that was a fantastic, <laughs> fantastic version of a Necron dynasty that was just scary as heck. And it's just that, yeah, corruption that they had. And <laughs> yeah, I really, mean, really neat. Super great stuff. So, I mean, I mean, things like that did change. Yeah. I'm not saying that the lore was locked in cement. Um, but timeline wise, it didn't really do much. It was more of an make evolution a of, of the an race. army. And what that does gameplay wise is it opens up a ton of options for game design space. Yeah. Which yeah. I think is. And the, for you to personalize your. Yeah, absolutely. Army. Yep. Paint it Other, how you want it. Otherwise they all look like dry bush. Right. <laughs> silver, you know. Um, so anyway, that's why I kind of steered away from those kinds. Of, I, I, I recognize that that happened. And for those who didn't know, like, yeah, I mean, it used to just be. Yep. And I remember Aaron at the time, our buddy uh, who plays Necrons, loves Necrons, has always loved Necrons because, as he'll tell you, they remind him of Terminator. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, really? Shocker. <laughs> what? They were influenced by huh. something. Uh, you know, Terranids are influenced by aliens. <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh. it's like, oh, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I, I think he would argue it, it's a, it, it was a good move for yeah. him. But I remember he was, like, ready to get out of 40K, and I was debating buying his... his uh, Necrons at one point. Oh, interesting. And yeah. then this was very early on. He hadn't played them in forever. Yeah. And then he got back into it because we did. Yeah. Um. So, you know, I mean, it, it was just an interesting shift change for them. Um. Yeah. And I think you've seen that across multiple armies, across multiple armies. But usually that doesn't have kind of the impact that I'm talking about. So anyway, we'll take a short break. We'll be right back, and, and we want to talk about even further changes as we move into kind of 8th edition, ninth edition, now 10th edition, where there's still, they're still making changes. Still changing. So we'll be right back. We're back, wrapping up over the next 40 minutes or so, I think. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, um, state of the galaxy. Uh, so we have, um, talked up to this point about kind of the transition from sixth and seventh, you know, and what occurred during that period. And now we're kind of leading into eighth edition. And so in September of 2017, uh, we have eighth edition, um, and in particular, we get the Death Guard Codex. And this is all new Death Guard models. Yeah. Which at first I was super excited about <clears throat> because I was a Death Guard player. Right. I have all these Forge World Death Guard models and stuff. As it came out, I knew it was super popular, and that's always my bane. Like right. If yep. something's yeah. popular. If it's in the box, then uh, it's yeah. going to be wildly popular. And it was also the first time this had really had its own kind of bespoke army treatment. Yeah. There had been Plague Marines forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And if you're on video, you're seeing my dog <laughs> chase her tail. Aria, lie down. So, uh, anyway. Sorry for that. Uh, yeah. But in addition to the Death Guard, comes Mortarian. So now we have the second Demon Primarch, Demon Primarch yep. re released. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, Mortarian's it's a gorgeous model. Yeah. Um, now, what's interesting is prior to this, we had seen Mortarian released in 30K. Right. Non-ascended form. Correct. So non-demon Mortarian. So we got a good look at, like, what he looked like before. Oh, that's a great model too. It is fantastic. Yeah. And what he now looks like. Um, going back to my point, like I kind of bow out of the death guard at that point. Ju Justin dives into them pretty hard. Yeah. Um, Brian went into them pretty hard there also. It just, it, something lost me on it. Like, it, I don't even know if it was the, the popularity or what it just, I think I was just moving on at that point. And by then I was so absorbed with my thousand sons too. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, Mortarian coming back again, I mean, other than the fact that you now have a second demon Primarch, which you can see on the table, it, it doesn't advance the storyline so much as there is this whole piece of Mortarian, uh, fighting against Ultramar, devastating parts of Ultramar, um, releasing a, a plague within their like a specific plague 
uh, that could even kill like a Primarch and a duel between Gilliman and Mortarian. But in typical games workshop fashion, like you have these great duels between these yeah. people and nothing really results. Something happens at the very <clears throat> end with the, the ground splitting between them yeah, and preventing yeah. them from it's always It's always something like yeah. that. Uh, yeah. I believe that actually uh, what occurred in this case is, I want to say Mortarian defeats Gilliman at one point, but then with this plague thing that's racing through him, but power of the emperor and you know the emperor's sword is able to disperse Mortarian for a time being or something. Yeah, I, regardless... Again, it's not really advancing the overarching storyline. Yeah. So much as you have a, a, a sector. I mean, arguably it does change Ultramar and some of the areas around it and, and whatnot. And I think it shows they are susceptible to damage. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And even Ultramar, which has probably been the most stable kind of there's even Imperium Secundus. At one Imperium point. Secundus, exactly. Um, it's really been its own kind of self-contained system of planets. Yeah. Um, but if they are even uh, susceptible to chaos right now and direct conflict on their in their home turf, there then exactly that is. And, and for those who don't know, Imperium Secundus refers to Ultramar and kind of these areas where <clears throat> during the Horus Heresy, uh, there was a period where they thought okay, the emperor has been slain because um, they had no contact right. with them. This is prior to even the siege of Terra. It's kind of as things are winding up to that. And uh, there's a point where they decide, you know, if if the emperor's vision is to continue, it will continue from here. Who do we make emperor in the set of losing the emperor? And, and Gilliman, the lion, and... Sanguinius are all discussing this, and I think they decide that Sanguinius should be that individual, but things don't plan out that way. It doesn't work out so yeah. well for him, unfortunately. But it was it was always considered like the backup plan right. in the event yeah. that something went wrong. Uh, he has a stick to it. So, yeah. So, Death Guard are back. Not a huge shift of, of stuff in 8th edition, like story-wise. There's a little bit, but not a huge shift. Where it really begins... And I guess it's towards eighth, towards into ninth, is the Indomitus Crusade. Right. And so this is actually, a, I think, a pretty interesting piece of, of time. Now, there have been a lot of crusades, Macarius Crusade, you know, all, all these different crusades that have taken place, let alone the Emperor's Crusade to take back the, the galaxy. Right. The Great Crusade. <clears throat> the Great Crusade. Um, the Indomitus Crusade. Uh, is there to serve a number of functions. And it's it's not quite as simple as it sounds. It's actually like 10 different fleets, massive fleets, like Gilliman, who is now kind of the regent of Terra. I don't know if that's his actual title. I don't believe it is, but he's kind of the head of all the military of, of Terra. <clears throat> um, says, you know, we're collapsing. We've lost all the stuff. We need to push back yeah. against chaos. This is how you do it. Yeah. And of course he's like this master strategist and lo logician. And so he, uh, <clears throat> he basically pulls in, he tells every fleet, every ship out there, basically come here to these points. We're going to form up a crusade. We're going to head out. The big push. The big push. Um, <clears throat> and what happens is you have a lot of... It's, it's, it's a very interesting point when they talk about it from his perspective because he had to give up on some worlds that were near collapse. And he was like, we could go reinforce them, but then what? They're just going to get retaken. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so he had to give up on some of these worlds. And in some cases, some of the defenders of those worlds refused to refuses order to come in and fought to the last there. And he's like, that's just wasted material at this point. Right. Right. Yeah. They, yeah. They just threw away can't ships in, we could have used. Wait, with their finite resources, they can't invest beyond. Right. They can't. There's only so much you yeah, can do. They can't put in, anything in towards a lost cause. Yeah. So, I mean, it's this massive, I mean, when I was reading about it, it's this massive 
organization that takes place where Gilliman is taking direct hand in it. He's negotiating with, you know, the, the mechanicus he's negotiating with the, uh, the, what do you call the, um, the guys that, uh, the navigator houses. Yeah. Right. He's negotiating with the Lords of Terra in the different areas that they control. Actually, what <clears throat> a really interesting piece here is the head of the navigator house tries to kind of get more out of of Gilliman than Gilliman's willing to give. Uh-huh. Right. To the point yeah. where he's like, Well, we're not gonna support this unless I'm given more control of blah blah blah. And Gilliman basically has him dragged out and burned at the stake <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to make a point. Yeah. That listen, I'm not screwing around. We're all I in thought, this together or we're all gonna die. I thought that was that was pretty awesome. <laughs> that, that'll make a point. <laughs> he made a point with him. They're like, oh yeah, you know, okay, what do you need? <laughs> um, so it, it's interesting that he gathers us, but he also creates a, and I cannot remember for the life of me the name of, of the organization he creates, but basically he creates this layer of the top people who understand the bureaucracy of the Imperium and how it works and brings them all together. And it's still like a million people or something yeah, like yeah. this. And has them and and has them gives them all authority to make all the decisions to choose what needs to go where and how to get it where it needs to be. And he's overseeing this personally for for the first part of this. So he has like this huge organization that he builds. <laughs> Expedited bureaucracy. To to cut through all the red tape and all the yeah. BS and 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 bring all these ships into the Sol system. As he's doing this, they become concerned because so many ships are transitioning in like so fast. Yeah. Yeah. Over the period of time that they're like, if we don't stop the speed at which this occurs, we may rip open a hole to the war permanent war right here. Right next like to we Terra. need to be careful. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so they end up picking like different Mandeville points. Mandeville points are the places where you can translate natural in and out. warp exits. <clears throat> so they pick like different areas. They kind of spread it out a little bit the pace does not stop. Right. They bring in, it, it's ultimately 10 different fleets over a period of time that get created to go do these different objectives. Um, and like, I think the first fleet was the one that was intended to go out first, but it ends up being like the third fleet that ends up going out first. Like there, I can't remember the precise details around the whole, the whole point here, but there was an immediate need for something and, the Gilliman had also picked the heads of each of these fleets and I, they were given titles. Um, I can't remember the title <laughs> that tells you how well prepared I am for this part, but basically there was, there was a, a head of each fleet and they had ultimate control over what that fleet did, where it did. It was going to go off and do its thing. So yeah, he had to trust in these people to yeah. do this. And the leader of the third fleet was like, oh, there's this huge problem. If we don't deal with this, this is going to be worse. And he's like, go deal with it. So the third fleet takes off and goes and deals with this. And then eventually the other fleets start spreading out. Now, some of the things that they would do is they would also bring, th- these fleets are a mix of different stuff. They're a mix of, of ad, ad Adeptus Mechanicus. They're a, a mix of... Um, even they, they pull even rogue traders in yeah, because yeah. the rogue traders know Imperial like Imperial Navy, secret Astartes routes. Chapters, yep. Rogue traders. Yep. yep. Imperial guard. Yeah. Like all of these are pulled in and the fleets are just made up. It, it would sound like a mishmash of things, but it's actually intentional that they are formed in exactly the way they are to achieve the goal that that fleet is set to sure, achieve. Right. But yep. some of these, um, some of these fleets contain, uh, uh, Space Marines that are Marines of the um, the uh, Primaris sort to go out and find chapters that are lagging, need support, and then provide that support. Or in some cases, they find these chapters are totally wiped out and they just restart the chapter as a Primaris chapter. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I, I want to say they call them lantern bearers or something like that. But basically, these guys go out... These Marines are specifically tasked. And they talk a lot, too, about the reaction to the Primaris Marines. Like, for the most part, 
Um, since these Marines are based upon the gene seed of the sire, in fact, they're even closer to it than the the old school Marines. Yeah, right. Right, that there's like this immediate bond in most cases. I mean, there's some where I think there's some resistance to it. I guess he were the dark angels would have a little resistance <laughs> yeah. to anybody with those secrets. But, but for the most part, I mean, they're happy to have that support. Yeah, and, and, and the reinforcement and just, yeah. And recognize what's going on. Um, oh, Adeptus Custodes are also part of some, some of this stuff. So they're all going out and accomplishing their own things. Something happens to the fourth fleet. It gets, uh, you know how they had the two chapters of Space Marines that there are two legions two of Space legions, Marines yeah. that they, they basically say, oh, redacted, redacted. That's what happens to the fourth fleet. Something happens mm. to the fourth fleet that, that is not covered. It's all redacted now. Interesting. Yeah. Um, it's interesting too, as they're writing this, and this is what I noticed with this particular piece, because now they're moving the story forward. Okay. They're the, um, Imperium is on its back heels, but now it's starting to push out. They're taking the fight to chaos. And again, this is also where I feel like, yeah, there's too much hope here yeah. <laughs> like in the way it's written. But I'll get to that because there's actually a point where I think they kind of correct course and fix that. Uh, but anyway, they're, they're, they're going out and, and accomplishing their, their various goals and, and beginning to push chaos back and reinforce and, and leaving behind um, the correct amount of force to hold planets that they then resecure. And it seems like it's, it's pretty successful. Um, it's interesting that as 10th edition released, they released that video of Gilliman right. talking about, oh, the fleet's going out and doing this. But then by the time you get to the end of his speech, you realize he's like saying, it's not the propaganda piece you think it is. It's, it's, it's not working. It's like, we've done all this and it's not enough. It's not enough. We're, yeah. It's not working. We're going to lose. Um, so I, I was glad to see that piece because up to that point, it felt like, oh, you're moving really forward here yeah you know, right without yeah. any like how we're awesome <laughs> yeah <laughs> everything's awesome right <laughs> um so i found I, I when i first read about the indomitus crusade i was like okay you know but as i read deeper into it and i'd encourage people to go look up some of this information or read it in your various um uh, 40k rule books but more than that, I mean, there's like a plethora of this stuff that's covered in the Black Library books. Yeah. But as I read more about it, I became much more interested in what it was. Originally, I just thought it was kind of just this one fleet of ships going around. And and one of these fleets of ships could decimate anything that it... I mean, it was just so massive. Yeah. When they were yeah. forming it, they say something to the effect of like, not, you know, uh, only prior when Horus had attacked... Terra, had you seen so many ships in the system? Like yeah. it was just, it's just like you could look up in the night sky and just, just see all the blocking ships. Blocking out the yeah. stars. <clears throat> so the other interesting tidbit there was was him dragging out the navigator house leader, right. basically <laughs> making an example of him. I thought that was kind of cool. But um, it, it, they, I actually think they do a pretty good job of explaining the scope of the crusade quote unquote, because it's really many, many different moving factors. And the fact that he had to create a whole layer of administration of the best yeah, of the administrators yeah. to just handle this. And then he ends up going out on crusade himself, leaving that administration thing to manage what's going on yeah. themselves. Which it's interesting how they've set it up too with that each kind of a fleet of the greater crusade is going off to complete a task, not dissimilar to Abaddon's black crusades of the past. Like each one oh, that's had been set out to achieve a specific, specific objective, trying to uh, get, except the, this kind is of, just all simultaneous. This is right? all happening at the same time because oh. they're desperate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of an interesting parallel that they've, uh, that's a good point. I created for them. I had not really, uh, I had not really drawn that, uh, correlation, but that, that's pretty good. So, uh, also towards the end of this, we get another Demon Prime Art returns. The world leaders come out with a codex and we get Angron. Angron. Uh, who is nigh unstoppable. I mean, he's he, just full of hugs he, and love. He, uh, I mean, they've written him to the point where like anytime he dies, he comes back in whatever it is, like eight, 88 days, 88 hours and or eight days, 88 hours. It's, it's, a, it's all eights. It's you a know? bunch of eights, yeah. Very uh, thematically. And he, and he can come back. Yeah. You know. Um, and he does on tabletop. 
Yeah. And again, like it's cool, but I actually don't think him coming back is, I think it's less impactful even than Magnus yeah. and Mortarian coming back because there are prior write-ups of him coming back. Correct. Right. Yeah. And this is all leading to my, my, the big reveal. Um, so it's, it's fine that he's coming back because he was at, I said Armageddon. Yeah. He, he'd one, shown up three. before. Yeah. yeah. He's shown up before and he, it's been written about. He's never necessarily been on the table. Right. It's a great model. Yeah. Yeah. This is a great model. Um, so he comes back um, and I'm thinking, okay, cool. You know, they've got, boy, I can't wait to see what they do with Slanesh. I do like the forge world Slanesh model. They came out with. Yeah. Super sick. Um, but now what comes out around that, shortly after that is the arcs of omen series. Mm -hmm. And this is a campaign that games workshop is running and campaign. It, it is a campaign. I just don't feel it's open-ended. Like, like I yeah, love the forge yeah. world open-ended campaigns right. where you can decide the fate of this is going to be decided. It's a narrative campaign. That's very focused <clears throat> and where it's starting and where it's finishing. Right. And it's not up for the players to decide in the campaign they introduce a couple of characters, but the big, the first big one they reveal is this new chaos character, Vashtor the Archfane, yeah. Archifane. Uh, so what's the big deal about this guy? Well, he's basic. He's kind of along the lines of um, Bellicor. Yeah, in the sense that he's, I, I've heard him referred to as a demigod, right? And his goal is to become the fifth chaos god. And so he needs to assemble this key, which will open the lock. And they're given these very generic terms. Yeah. Like, yeah. Talk <laughs> about distilling it down to a MacGuffin, right? <laughs> He's got to assemble all these pieces of a key to open this lock, which opens this weapon. Get and the artifacts. Yes. Take the ring and he's got to throw it. In the yeah. <laughs> but... What's interesting about this is like there's an actual goal there. Yeah. Okay, cool. I love it. It's kind of a neat model. Um, the cool thing with him too is he's kind of uh, I don't know his his role is uh, he's in charge of all the soul forges, so all the right. the demon machine kind of hybrids. He's got a very dark mechanicus vibe to it with that kind of demon machine hybrid yeah. uh, kind of just vibe going for him. And whatever he's looking to accomplish, ultimately, he's trying to become this fifth chaos god. Yeah. So as the Arcs of Omen continues, starts with Abaddon, moves on to you know these various books, in the three books, and it comes to um, the third one, The Lion. Yeah. Uh, they're engaged in this battle at the rock, what's left of the rock. Uh, it's now called the Wildwood. Weirdwood, I've got that wrong. It's what it's I what chaos it's what word. chaos is referring to. Yeah, the wormwood. Okay. Uh and what ends up happening is you have Dante involved there. Um, Angron shows up. <laughs> He's kicking everybody's butt. He's about to kill Dante. Dante is like critically injured. He's about to kill him. When out of the shadows, literally comes the lion which they explain that <laughs> that <laughs> mechanic in and and he book, stops but. he stops angron sword from descending gets into a massive battle with angron ends up beating angron he has the emperor shield which basically makes him not invulnerable in some cases and so he ends up dueling and beating angron dispersing him for a time um a couple of days <laughs> so this is another major shift. And and I think Lionel Johnson returning is a big shift. And here's why I think that's the case as opposed to, I mean, I guess all the loyalist primarchs that have come back have been for a big shift. I would say not so much the demon prime, right? Cause yeah, they've always yeah. in the background kind of been there. They're just part of that bigger ethereal chaos, right? Kind of story and um, right. goal. Right. Right. But the reason I think the lion returning is a big thing is because, excuse me, a couple things have occurred. One, he has gone through and um, gathered up some of the fallen yeah. 
and made them and the ones that have gone not gone completely to chaos right. the, the ones that are more like renegade marines yeah gathered them about them about him forgiven them and now calls them uh the risen and they're basically following him around yeah um and they've pledged to him uh okay cool so this changes the dark angels history a bit like it's or, or trajectory it's a perspective for sure yeah because the historic 40k dark angels are obsessed with hunting the fallen yes so it's going to be interesting to see what yeah competition happens there but they see him upon this return right right they they see him and they immediately fall in line with him while they're there in fact they send like the what are they called the death wing yeah out to help support him and all this stuff so it's it's kind of cool it's a pretty cool actually it's a pretty cool scene and actually, somebody gets defeated. Although, really, they just get kind of banished. Like, this is the thing. You can kill the demon Primarchs over and over. They'll keep coming back. They'll just keep coming back. But at least you have a That's definitive. The perfect bad guys. You but you do have kind of a definitive victory yeah. there. Yeah. Um, For a time. But here's the other reason. Okay, so the other thing I would say is he has this ability to kind of teleport around the galaxy. Yeah. Um, which I'm not quite sure where that's coming from. Uh, the watchers in the dark have shown yeah. him the way. I don't yeah. think even the lion understands exactly. He doesn't. So, and, and they're making it vague on purpose. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, so he can teleport around the galaxy, but I think the most important part is at least where we've seen him the most is on the other side. Yeah, absolutely. Of the cicatrix maledictum. Yep. So now you have a leader a powerful leader on the other side of the cicatrix maledictum. I'm more curious to hear about his stories than I am to hear about. Yeah. Yeah. Gilliman's stories. And that for me reading, um, the lion was it, uh, something of the forest, something of the forest. Yeah, I don't yeah. remember what it is. It was the first book where he came. Yeah. Back. Um, that was really interesting and in seeing what they had revealed about the other side and him kind of building almost this mini tiny empire in comparison to yeah. the Imperium. Cause it's really one or two planets. What's interesting was I didn't think, the depiction of the stuff on the other side there in that book was as good as like the depiction in the spears of the empire. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I'd like to see them lean into yeah, spears. Is so good. like <laughs> these people are just struggling, Yeah, you know, um, there you had a fairly stable planet or two. Yeah. Where, yeah. Minus some renegades coming in yeah. and doing their thing. Yeah. 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 Um, but I think that that offers them the ability to now look through his eyes at a wider scope of what's going on on the other side. Yeah. Uh, and I'm curious to see what communication ends up happening between him and Gilliman. And right, Gilliman, yeah, that'll be a really interesting. Because right now nothing's happened. <laughs> right. Um, oh, and that was the other point I was going to make when Gilliman came back. To, he knows Gilliman is back. I don't know if Gilliman knows that the lion has returned. I don't, I don't recall yet. yet. Yeah. yeah. But the interesting thing there, too is when Gilliman was organizing the crusade, he also had to work with the ecclesiarchy mm -hmm. to whom, you know, are really the antithesis which of what his father wanted. Completely heretical from a 30 K perspective, which uh -huh. is really when the height of the, the primarchs is right. They're literally the emperor was not a God. Yeah. Defiance of the Imperial <laughs> truth. <now> he right? is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so it's a very different and world. We also didn't mention that Gilliman, when he gets back to Terra at that point, goes into speak to his father, speak quote unquote to his father. He goes into the golden throne area, um, is in there for some amount of time and comes out and immediately is like, we're going to do this crusade. Yeah. So there's a lot of discussion about, and this was a very interesting point too. Is it a decree from the emperor that said, Hey, go set up this crusade, do this, do that or the other thing. Yeah. Or is Gilliman, and, and some people whisper that Gilliman is trying to supplant his father and recreate that glory and go off and do this, and he's doing it for the wrong reasons, which I don't think is the case. I don't know if his father spoke to him. I kind of feel like he did. He probably. I, psychically. I mean, yeah, he's he's the corpse emperor, but he's There's still, still something so there. psychically yeah. resonant to yeah, some degree. Who knows how? I think he did. I mean, we've yeah. seen points where like we saw in the black legion book um by aaron dimsky bowden 
where like he had some interaction with the the astronomicon and mm -hmm. i want to say he like i need to go back and read that book again like, yeah it's such a good book i think he like, had the <laughs> The, the presence of the emperor was there at yeah. one point. Yeah. And so I think that b certainly these creatures, and I call them creatures because they're not humans, the emperor and yeah. Gilliman, being in such close proximity to each other, probably had, and this is all speculation on my part, probably had some kind of form, some form of communication. I don't think Gilliman went in and saw a corpse sitting on the thing. It was like, I get nothing. <laughs> and then came out and goes, hey, start a crusade. <laughs> you know? He said, well, I mean, he's a tactical genius, right? So he, he just is. sat there and made a plan. And yeah. <laughs> Drew it in chalk on the ground. Hey, if you, you know, walk out like you uh, belong there with confidence and uh, have a plan, then the, the <laughs> so Imperium I, will follow suit. So I do think the Return of the Lion is, is, is a big deal. Yeah. Like, yeah. And I've, you know, originally... When Gilliman came out, there was no plans to bring any other Primarchs back. And I'm, and I'm, again, speaking from a point of I knew the people working on it. I knew they were like, ah, this is it. And this is why I always say never say never with well, Games Workshop. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Never say never. And now that the storyline is progressing, because, again, now you have this return In a really interesting Primark. way, yeah. I mean, there was a lot of discussion prior to this as to who would be more interesting to have return would it be the lion would it be uh um, what's the imperial fist uh dorn dorn you know um no <laughs> i don't think so i think i think the lion offers way more interesting yeah. story potential than dorn were yeah for sure and i think if they bring anybody else back i my my figures are crossed for uh for it being vulcan for just he's oh, he vulcan, really is the vulcan humanitarian is, of yeah. the, the primarchs in the whole chapter and look at um Pariah Nexus and yeah. the salamander, like saving yeah. everyday citizens of the planet. That I, I had a conversation with Jeff about that because Jeff played salamanders yeah. for years. And one of the things he liked about salamanders was he's like, these guys watch out for the humans, like they're yeah. protecting them. Yep. And I was like, oh, okay. And then uh, I don't remember who was writing the books, uh, for the salamander, the initial salamanders books. Um, uh, Nick Kime did Nick a Kime. handful of those. Nick so Kime. Yeah. And I think Nick uh, did a good job of showing that the salamanders – we're taking that protective stance for the most part. Like there's some inner strife going on there and some don't agree, blah, blah, blah. Right. That makes for a story. Yeah. But in general, like I like their stance. I think Vulcan would be a very interesting yeah. returning character. And allegedly he's an eternal. So wherever he is right. could come back. Spoiler alert. But yeah, he is. So if you don't know that by now, you got to get on the Horace Heresy series. <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah, I think they made a good choice, honestly. And the model's gorgeous. I mean, the model's stunningly gorgeous. Yep, absolutely. But it also creates this, where I feel like Gilliman coming back, the Ultramarines will be like, hey, Gilliman's back. What do you want him to do, boss? You know? Yeah. yeah. The Dark Angels are like, oh, the Lion's back. Hey, by the way, we have all these traitor guys we need to slaughter, and we're worshiping the Emperor. And he's like, yeah, we're all going to slow our roll here, yeah. <laughs> right? Like, so there's a big misunderstanding. <laughs> yeah, and and it's interesting because even in that book, The Lion, The Something of the Forest. Uh, <laughs> Son of the Forest. Son of the Forest. <laughs> sure, let's call it that. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, there is this, like, he has conflict with some of them, and he's concerned that they're not going to follow him. Right. And he's yep. like, okay, well, you know, I'll, what am I going to do then? So it. It is interesting, and I'll be. I'm curious to see more interaction between yeah. he as he reintegrates his chapter, if possible. Uh, if there's a, if, it'd be weird if there was a splinter thing there. Um, yeah, it's somehow they'll, they'll have to come together because I mean, on the Sycatrix side of things, like the only Dark Angels he has are fallen. Yeah. Who are just renegade? They're not not chaos renegade. The but ones he's taking. The ones there are chaos. Right, there are on. there are ones that have gone full, yeah. full chaos. Absolutely, yeah. but uh, a large percentage of the dark angels last on left on Caliban before it. <laughs> yeah, before everything went uh, went up in flame there. Um, and so before I move into like where things are going with tenth edition, the other thing I want to point out is we've been working at the forty first millennium. Warhammer 40K. It's not Warhammer 41K. It's Warhammer 40K. But we were very near the end of the 41st millennium in the writings yeah. up to this point. Yeah. And so how do they fix that? Well, 
timekeeping hasn't been quite what we thought it was. Records are screwed up. Records are skewed. As the Indominus Crusade heads out, um, they recognize that warp travels become difficult and and uh, hard to work with, and that ships will go into the warp and come out a hundred years earlier, <laughs> two hundred years right, earlier. Yeah, yeah. Like there's all this screw up going on. And so they come up with this system where they say, okay, <clears throat> the main ship sets its chronometer. That's the time, regardless of where we go, <laughs> you know? And so um, it's it's not a perfect solution, but it's one way that the authors and writers are get around. Like, because how long does the Indominus Crusade go? You know, at first it was something like 15 years, but now it's more like 100 years. But when did it start? Nobody's really sure. Right, yeah. Like, And yeah. they've kept the timeline now intentionally vague. It's more vague and fluid at the same time. To give them room to play around in. Why you need room to play around in a limitless time thing, I don't know. Because they don't want to go to 41. They don't want to go to Warhammer 41K. <laughs> so I think that's really the, the crux of it. Look, we've got a brand IP of 40K. Yeah. Um, But also it just offers them more flexibility and can create some and interesting, interesting story. stories. Stories. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So now we've reached 10th edition Leviathan. Um, previous edition, ninth edition, the focus was really chaos versus loyalist Marines. Right now. And you can always tell this by the initial base box set. Now really the focus is Tyranids versus. Um, well, it was more Necrons in ninth. Edition. Oh yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Mm. Good point. I take that back. The which edition, was the return of the silent King, which it, does is prior to that change lore to some degree. And part of that evolution, silent King coming back and reawakening mm -hmm. and re kind of kindling the Necron empire. So it's kind of waking it up fast. Yeah. I mean, beyond that, it doesn't really change like the trajectory of anything. Right. It, similar to like big picture change. There's a lot happening there and, and like reclaiming and there's a lot of peripheral stuff happening, but as far as the main kind of uh, interaction of chaos versus the Imperium, and I guess I'm looking from an Imperium perspective, right. like from, yeah. from a Necron perspective, that's huge. That's a big deal. Right. That's huge. Yeah. And how, how large their empire is and how, um, you know, diminished they are, but quickly reawakening and rekindling. Yeah. Um, it, it's similar. I think it's setting up for more future threats from, even more directions right? Uh, for, for a later date to be expanded upon. Right, right, yeah. right. That's a good point. Actually, I can't believe I skipped right past the Necron starter set. It was the 8th edition starter set that was Chaos versus... Right. It was the ninth edition that was Necrons, the Praia. Right, yep. Uh, and now we uh, reach into Leviathan, <clears throat> which is interesting. I like, I like that they're cycling through. Yeah. I don't know if they've, they've, ever, they've never done a starter set with Tau. They have not. Uh, not really. Not like a a a, a version starter set. Yeah, with de Tau. definitely not. Like there have been edition. like sets that yeah. have Tau versus. Remember, they were doing a lot of Tau versus this or yeah. Eldar versus that. Um, so Leviathan, which does change some lore again. Yep. Not only is the Imperium beset by the Great Rift and all the chaos forces they're dealing with. And, Necron's waking Necron's up. Necron's waking up. <laughs> Which, you know, side note. Uh, now you have um, the Tyranid High Fleet of Leviathan, which was once thought defeated at Ball. Um, the Blood Angels were involved in that combat. They ended up destroying the the tendril. As the, the Tyranids attack, they always attack in these large tendrils yeah. into the galaxy. Yeah. Um, one of the cool things, one of the coolest pictures I've ever seen is, um, a picture of the galaxy, but on its side. So you're seeing it along the plane. Oh yeah. And you see the Tyranid tendrils coming up from below. Cause I always, you always think of like them coming from outward, but up and down are irrelevant. You got, <laughs> got all, all three, axes all the, all the ways. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the fourth tyrannic war begins. We've had three tyrannic wars up to this point. We thought Leviathan was destroyed at Ball, at least shattered into all these splinters. Yeah. Um, which was more, the, the tendril was destroyed. Nope, it wasn't destroyed. As it turns out, um, three other tendrils, the third one hidden by the first two, 
that attack attack entirely different parts of the galaxy. Right. Yeah. Hiding the fact that this massive third one uh, attacks as well. Um, never a good time for a Tyranid attack. Probably the worst <laughs> time for a Tyranid Couldn't attack. Couldn't be right worse now. now. Couldn't yeah. be worse. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, you, you know the in the the interesting thing here too, and I don't believe this as a model yet. But I'm curious to see if they ever do create a model for it. Is they introduce a new kind of main character to the storyline, Lord Commander Solar Leonotis. Le- Leonotis? Le- Leon- Leontis. Leontis. Um, who is uh, the Lord Commander is like kind of the supreme commander of the Astra Militarum. Yep. Uh, and he is working on how do we deal with the Tyranid crisis. But he's he's a pretty capable, obviously he's a super capable leader to be put in charge of everything. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, but I think it's cool that they've introduced like this whole new, like, oh, this is like, this this dude's in charge of all the Imperial Guard. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, and so there's a mystery that's only been teased so far, which is that um, Imperial recon forces in the distant edges of the assaulting tendrils have begun reporting back this discovery of these mysterious moon-sized structures that are tyranid in nature. The yeah, picture I saw of them yeah. were like these huge moons with like tendrils coming off yeah. of them, moving around out there. Just big, so big spawning base. <laughs> who knows? Yeah. I mean, you know, there's supposed to be this, well, hypothetically, there's this hive fleet mother or brood mother or whatever out there um that's in communication with everything yeah but i mean what are these things you know who knows we'll I, find I'm, out. I'm, I hope so yeah. like i like see i like that they've added something like that and, and gw is doing a pretty good job of adding like breadcrumbs of things like that that, that kind of tease you about what's going on and it gives them room to operate later right like yeah. what was yeah. that oh well it's this they've done this for years yeah and it's neat that they do things in not just ways that are going to result into models and things on the game table, but uh, just big, bigger picture things. Like the galaxy is so huge, not everything has to be represented on the table, but there's these right. pieces, these pieces in play that are affecting the greater kind of chess match of the galaxy at war. Yeah. Which is neat. And for the Tyranids in particular, it's very easy for them to add new units anytime they want because they're supposed to be infinitely yeah, adaptable they're just eating and evolving and taking so we did and... get some new models which is cool yeah like i think the tyrannids have been kind of a punching bag for a while and um i know when i was running them in seventh i was very frustrated like yeah. it was an uphill slog every battle like they were so woefully un under strength they, mm. they didn't have really much that could penetrate vehicles with any ranged effectiveness it was it was a tough time to be a tyrant. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you have some new species. You have the Norn emissaries, which are, which are awesome, super hive tyrants. Norn assimilators, <laughs> which yeah. it's a multi part kit, and neuro lictors. I think there's a couple others in there too. But and they've remodeled. They've you know the von Royen leaper leapers. Yeah, uh, Von Ryan Leapers yeah. are the like kind of yeah. mini, mini Lictors. And then they did the Death Leaper. They finally gave the new Death Lictors, Leaper model, yeah, new Which Death was an older, an older unit, yeah. but now they've given them a model, which yeah. is sick. It's just so good. It's a, it's a good one. Yeah. So I'm excited to see the Tyranids kind of resurgent, not just because I have Tyranids, but because I've always loved them as a It's a cool, a villain. cool villain, yeah. Yeah, yep. yeah. And in fact, I mean, so we ran, the, one of the problems we ran into... Using that campaign system we talked about earlier yeah. was I wanted to run this Tyranid versus everybody else campaign. And we had a number of Tyranid players at the time. We were just getting our <laughs> teeth kicked in. every Like there was yeah. just nothing we could do. It's like, okay. I heard eh. some very memorable games from that. but <laughs> You and I had some great games. Yeah. Like I had a lot of fun with my Tyranid. You know, maybe I need to latch on to not so much is this Tyranid model one I root for is who do I get to kill with these various models? Like I need to think, who do maybe, I get to eat? Maybe I got to think in that direction. Cause like I said earlier in the show, playing Tyranids, I, I like them in, in theory. I like them. I like the way they play. I think the thing is I never get to draw like a correlation to them. I never have like any particular feelings like, Oh, I lost my hive tyrant. There goes hive tyrant. 
<laughs> XXYBG. You know, I mean, it's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You, you don't I'll just the, spawn another the one. The personal cl- connection to them. Right, yeah. right. Whereas, you know, when I build like a chaos models and stuff, like I, I feel a very personal connection to Armin, which yeah. is why he always teleports up to the battle barge and never gets killed. They're so. <laughs> yeah. uh, Oh, they're just so uh, alien, for yeah. lack of a better term, yeah. that it's hard to identify with them and their motivations and things like that, as far as we know, are just feed. Like, that's yeah. it, right? So, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think that's kind of taken us through the major kind of waves of how the how the story's progressed. From a point, and again, I can't reiterate enough that we went from a point of 25 to 30 years of no movement at all. Right. Two minutes to midnight, boom, this is it. Everything takes place here. Nothing really changes the galaxy. Nothing significant to, the galaxy's been ripped in half. Yeah. Everything's coming from everywhere. Got Primarchs coming got back. Primarchs coming back. You know, we're pulling from his, future history. We're pulling from... You know, we got demon Primarchs coming back. Man, I can't believe they haven't ordered any Slanesh. The, the, um, what's his name? Uh, Fulgrim. Fulgrim. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, I hope, I hope they do. I really hope they do. Yeah. Cause I mean, I mean, the, the 30K resin version of that is is incredible. So I can't, (laughs) I, it's, it's funny. I've seen some of the commentary around that. And, you know, I mean, originally with Horus Heresy back when Alan was alive. <clears throat> the the plan was we're going to release all the primarchs then we're going to release the ascended primarchs right. the, the ones who go full chaos so yep. basically you're gonna get two of each of those and um i mean you're starting to see kind of some of it you see horus horus ascended yep, got horus ascended you, you got now you got fulgrim yep right oh, man <laughs> that fulgrim model I, I, the, the comment i saw that made me chuckle was first off people are hating on the forge world resin okay whatever um was I'm going to get this guy. I'm going to paint him and never touch him again. <laughs> Cause he's pretty spindly. That's got to be the fragilest game piece. It ever looks made, so fragile. But it's gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man. It's, yeah. Anyway. Anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, as I kind of was reading up on a lot of this and, and studying where things had gone and, and it's still evolving, yeah. you know, um, I think I appreciate more where they went. I, again, I mean, I'll go back to my point about I don't think the writing clearly reflected the scope of the change, yeah. the, the horror behind the change. I think they need to lean more into the horror. Yeah. Alan, uh, John French, I always have to say John French so people don't think of but Alan Bly, John French, those guys are huge fans of like Call of Cthulhu. They've written yeah. Yeah. for Ar- Arkham Horror stuff, right? Yep. They've written... Uh, if you look at the, the RPG we played, you know, that scenario is very, very Call of Cthulhu-esque. Call yeah. of Cthulhu in space type yeah. of yeah. scenario. <laughs> um, they embrace that piece. So when you saw their Forge World writings, and this is so hard to just describe the difference between reading one of, these, one of these Forge World books where it was very gritty and it felt like it felt like it had this veneer of of realness to it. And then you read the standard games workshop book. And you're like, yeah, this is more comic booky, right? More. Right. Yeah. It's, it's harder for me to believe some of this. It's all silly. Right. But when I would read the 40 K, the 40 K stuff in the, the Imperial armor books, like I would really get wrapped into it. Yeah. Like, oh man, this yeah. is horrible. I, I don't know what, <laughs> I don't know what that difference is. They, I think they take the time to explore things in more depth and detail. Like you get more of a macro view or maybe it's, it is just grittier. Um, they would do things like they did it with Vrax very well. Originally well, Vrax was a bit of a slog. So that's probably not the best example, but they do do this with Vrax where they like, they'll go in, they'll talk about this particular unit or even this guy in this unit. And then they pull out yeah. and then they go back in over here and yeah. then they pull out. And I don't know how that was done so well. You get a good overview, but then you get these little macro. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. For example, in, in Vrax, you know, they're talking about, and again, the three book set of Vrax is great, but it arguably goes on too long. And Warwick can raid was a world war one, world war two tank buff. And so you have a lot of world war one kind of fighting going on there. They had to fight with them to throw in like 40 K stuff. (laughs) But once, 
once the world eaters show up, like I remember reading the, the Death Guard and the world eaters all show up there and demons show up, and blah, blah, blah. But I remember reading, you know, they're talking about, okay, you know, um, this company is here and they're fighting this and this company, you know, fighting these remnants and blah, blah, blah. And it's, this is what's going on in this line. And then they go down to this story of the um, corn berserkers show up and, and they're describing it like, the difference is like how I said the siege of Rax, or excuse me, the um, Cadian, uh, Cadia Falls thing. When 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 you got the ground eye person view, so yeah. they'd go down to like this, and this you know berserker climbs up on this tank, rips the top off the tank, pulls the guy out, and like rips his head off, and and you're like, oh oh, we're we're down in the trenches yeah, now. We're okay, in it. yeah, a yeah. Plus it, it, it's just very interesting, and. It, I don't know if it's just a writing style. I don't know if it's the way they told the story, but it really conveyed that. And yeah. I wish yeah. that we saw that as the Cicatrix Maledictum was coming to the forefront. Codexes and lore books campaign or otherwise kind of have to be the cliff notes for yeah. the big picture where it really, you get a whole team of black library authors that can then just kind of go in and hyper focus and really specialize in telling a story with conflict and character development and all that. That's a good point. Really macro views, uh, which like, I love that they, they, they kind of create the bullet points and then let authors go in and then fill in like very specific details. But I think they are, they have an idea of where the, the bigger overarching story is going. But they because it is so big, like the galaxy is so big, there's so many things happening. There's so many factions involved yeah. that it's hard to tell all that detail. You know, they destroyed a world yeah. in Warhammer Fantasy over the span of five massive books. Right. They ripped the galaxy in half with 320-page books in 40K. Right. And I just feel like it deserved more. Yeah. Yeah. If it had been given more weight, it would feel more heavy at that time. It has taken me till now to recognize the futility of the fight in what's going yeah. on, you know, yeah. and it's hard because I mean, also as a, from a game perspective, you want to put out new models, you want right. to put out new designs. You don't want to sell your, which, you're only going to sell so many land Raiders and right. then you're done selling land Raiders, which means you need to keep evolving and upgrading yeah. and yeah. creating new things. But you need to explain that in such a way that it's like, yeah, we've, you know, oh, well, also, um, call or some other guy had all these STCs that they've discovered, you know, or yep. please be somebody other than Belisarius call, yeah. right? So that you're spreading it out a little bit, yeah. right? Yeah. Or we unlocked these that we'd kept hidden for some reason and so and so negotiates to get them released. And I don't know, I don't know what the answer is, but, um, that's why I'm not writing for my. <laughs> Because writing is a lot harder than I realized. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think it's cool. I, I'm, I went from a staunch, do not move, the story forward. It's a setting, not a story. It doesn't need to move forward. To, yeah, I'm okay with you moving the story forward, but I want you to explore how dark it is. And for a long time, I didn't get that sense that it was. Like, yeah. like, oh, they ripped the galaxy in half. But, you know, hey, they got this big crusade and they're fighting. They got Primaris Marines. I'm like, oh, so, you know, okay. Uh, the field of battle smaller, I guess. But, you know, and then Aaron wrote Spears of the Emperor and I saw the other side of the fence and I was like, oh, oh, oh yeah. I want to know more about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's that's super grimdark. Yep. <laughs> like, I thought it was yeah. grimdark before and then it got super grimdark. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, so anyway, I think that brings us up to date. We got the, the Tyranid Hive Fleet Leviathan causing a massive invasion into the galaxy. Coming now. in hot, yep. And uh, I'm curious to see where it goes from here. I'm, the other point I neglected to mention was Vastor the Archophane succeeds at the end of this. While the lion is fighting Angron, Vastor is able to sneak into, this is where the big thing is, this is, I can't believe I forgot to mention this. Vastor is able to sneak into what's left of the rock, find and assemble the final part of this key. Yeah. The rock is destroyed and basically sucked into the warp, and now there's a warp rift where it was. But in theory, Vastor has succeeded at what he's trying to do, so now he can go unlock whatever he needs to unlock, Yeah. get whatever 
weapon or whatever it is, the weapon. I mean, that's because him, it. him and Abaddon had an alliance because mm-hmm. they, they realized they needed to work together to achieve their goals, separate goals, but they right. needed to work together in order to, but I mean, them. so Abaddon wants the weapon. Vashtor wants to become a God. Do you think they make a fifth chaos God? I can't imagine they do, but at this point, that's, I wouldn't put anything past the story it. forward. Right? I wouldn't put anything past yeah. it at this point. It'd be interesting. And maybe the Eldar will kill Slanesh. And then they just replace a fourth chaos God with Vashtor. He'll be the, God of technology. Yeah. Dark Mechanicum. What would, he, what would he be the God of? Like those, I don't know. We're going to get off. We're going to get off topic <laughs> here. But I mean, that's a, that's a very valid point. Like I think they've opened the door to whatever's going to come next. Yeah. I would just love to see him treat it with like a huge amount of weight. Like I don't, I see what they're trying to do, but it, it doesn't feel like it to me. It's, it is interesting from a, I think a writing standpoint and a game design standpoint and that you can't affect the game that much, but you also have this amazingly well-rounded in-depth lore of a universe that's been created. Yeah. Um, and you have lots of knobs and levers to tweak, but you can't, but you are limited. You can't, <laughs> you can't do the big stuff that really makes a difference. Yeah. Uh, which is interesting. So there's a lot of, a lot of little ways that they move the story forward. I will bet as a black library author that is somewhat constricting. It's, yeah. it's, it's probably one of two things. One, uh, it's probably helpful in some ways because like, oh, well, I have this sandbox that I play in right. and here are the rules yep. of the sandbox. But two, you can't go out of those rules and create whatever right. you want. You know, so you can get very creative inside of that space. Like constraints can definitely lead to some yeah. interesting creativity and some great stories and conflicts and things. Like Spears of the Emperor is a perfect example yeah, of that. Love that book. Um, yeah, but some of the, the big, big picture stuff yeah. to really do it justice, I think, would have to happen in a novel form and less so in a Agreed. a game, a rule book, a new edition, something Agreed. like that. Agreed. Which is too bad. Or they like put out put out a movie or something like that that is just the lore and explaining and yeah. We'll see if that ever comes, but. Well, okay. Well, that's that. Yeah. So let's do this. Let's take a break and we'll come back and we'll close out the show. Sounds great. All right. And we're back to finally close out episode 225. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. If you, I'm open to any other thoughts and discussion too, we'll create a thread in our Facebook group as we usually do to have all this discussion around. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure we've missed a ton of stuff. Like again, this was There's not no way we could no. cover all the depth and detail. But which, what would be, which I realized yeah. as I started writing yeah. these notes, I'm like, what am I doing <laughs> to myself? You've created the impossible task unless we're spending 20 episodes just. Correct. Going into deep dive the lore stories. Correct. Uh, but it would be cool to hear in that thread uh, some of the things, some of the specific details that yeah. uh, people have really... That clicked with people. Clicked right? with them. Um, and then everybody can kind of get a highlight that way of some some of the more depth and detail on that. would be cool to see in yeah. the thread. Yeah, yeah. It's good stuff. I, I, I have to say I'm on board. Like, I'm now like, okay, let's see where this goes. Yeah. Um, I just, it needs to remain gritty. Yeah. Regardless. Abs- oh, yeah. So. Yeah. And I think it only... We'll get more grimdark. It's never going to turn into Star Trek. Yeah. <laughs> if it no, does, I'm not. out. Yeah. I'm no, out. That's it. <laughs> All right. Uh, final thoughts. Uh, final messages here. So um, <clears throat> on a separate note, and I meant to talk about this during the Hobby Progress. I talked about that earlier. Uh, this Sunday, I fly up to uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, uh, to play at with Play on Tabletop. Yeah. I'm going to play uh, Nick Freeze up there. That's awesome. Uh, I am bringing my thousand sons with some demons attached to them. And I have like a smattering of units. Like it's not a hard hitting like tournament list. And Nick knows that too. He told, like I said, he told me, uh, oh, well, I lose all my games. I go, well, you're about to win your first <laughs> one. <laughs> so don't worry about it. Um, so it's a 2000 point game. I'm super excited to see their production. I talked to uh, Mini Wargaming Dave about it a bit because he went up there and filmed and I was like, Oh, so tell me how it was. So he and I chat occasionally. Um, and he was like, that's yeah, pretty impressive. Like they, they really got it down to nice. a science. I'm yeah. like, I'm super excited to see how they do it. So, uh, I'll, I'll take lots of behind from the production side. I'll yeah. take lots of behind the scene <laughs> pictures and video for you. Nice. Um, I don't, I don't want to release that without their approval. Cause I mean, it's their, their shop. 
Um, but I've been super looking forward to this. And Nick came and asked me to do it at Adepticon. And yeah, that's awesome. So here we are. So yeah, Sunday I fly up there. We're filming Monday and Tuesday, I think, or all day Monday. And then I fly home Tuesday. Nice. So, and then I talked to Nick the other day, we will have Nick come on our show and we'll talk all about like the behind the scenes shenanigans and what, what went on and how, and we'll interview him at length about how they go about this. And I have, now I'll have some insight yeah. to yeah. ask the Fantastic. questions. I think you'll really enjoy it. I think it'll be a fun interview too. So we'll get Nick on and some of his guys to talk about all that and what they're doing up there, which is just amazing stuff. You know, as we like, as we were talking about stuff to do for the video, which we, again, we were talking today about, we've yep. got a really good idea that I don't think anybody else is really doing. Um, and executable by us. Like it's, yeah. it's executable. Yeah. Uh, one of the things you'd brought up, well, maybe we should do some battle reports and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, man, there are people that are out there doing battle reports that are so good now. Like the time and energy we would, and money we would need to invest to be at that level, I think is just ridiculous. And these guys are doing it. Yeah. Like yeah. Their stuff is off the hook good. I, I feel honored that they asked me to come out there and, play in it and uh you know i think it's it's gonna be a blast nice guy fun opponent good looking army it'll be great you're gonna have a great time yeah that's for sure for sure hopefully we can do a lot of cuts so i can go look up my rules um <laughs> so I'm, I'm hoping to get a practice game in by saturday before i go up there so because i fly out sunday morning uh let's see leave us reviews on itunes on whatever you leave us reviews on you know whatever whatever you're your podcast app of choices. Yep. We'd love it. Um, if you have any suggestions, we're open to that. You can reach me at Carl at the independent characters.com. You can reach Josh at Josh at the independent characters.com. That's right. Uh, you can join our Facebook group. If you're, if you want your friends to join the Facebook group, please ask them to join and, and fill out the questionnaire. If you invite them through Facebook, they don't get the questionnaire. We automatically decline those. Yeah. Because that helps us avoid lots of spam. And let me tell you, a lot of spammers trying to get in there every a lot day. Of spammers, a lot every of day. There. Yep. Uh, yeah, and we have a Patreon. Patreon's going well. Uh, in fact, we're going to drop this episode a little bit early for Patreon members, like we did the last episode. And we're just about to release our second episode of the uh, Dark Heresy role playing game we're playing. And I've got an interview coming up for our. Uh, faces of, of 40k uh series that's going on there too so um lots of good stuff yeah i've alluded to a few times so we definitely have enough content for the uh, outtakes oh you can start yeah, putting that so together that that'll that'll happen cool that'll destroy that'll our reputation yeah. <laughs> why don't we just cancel ourselves <laughs> right now you canceled yourself uh yeah my dog's sleeping in here everybody's oh, happy yeah uh, we, we got a YouTube channel, so check us out on YouTube. We'll definitely have more content that is going to be more video. And we keep saying that, but it's because we're making plans yeah, we're, to we, execute it correctly. We've got a lot of things we're, we're working on, and we're getting mm -hmm. closer and closer to pulling mm -hmm. the trigger on those. Um, certain episodes obviously lend themselves more towards the video format. Than this, some are, this next thing that we're talking about is definitely going to, like, we'll release it in audio. You'll hear descriptions of things, but seeing it in video will make a huge difference yeah, i think it'll it'll be the the true experience for yeah, yeah. it's gonna, i'm looking forward to i think it's gonna be super fun and the other thing i'll say just because a couple people have found us on youtube specifically is uh if you're not a member of our facebook community it's a great community there i know you mentioned it already but things like our elite choices are being pulled from that group. So if you want to see more from people, like you have to be a part of that Facebook community. Somebody was asking if we could link things to the people because they wanted to look mo up more yeah. of um, elite choices that have been chosen. And you that's only accessible if you're in the Facebook community because it is a private group there. So yep. if you want to see more, join the group and you'll see a plethora of people putting out awesome The questions to answer are super easy yeah. if you've ever listened to an episode of the show. They so, don't even have to be right. They don't even have to be right. You just have to take a stab at them. Just, just prove that you're a human. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. There's been a couple that have tried to slip by. I'm like, there is yeah. no way this is even an answer remotely in the category of what I just asked you. So anyway, this has been fun. Yeah. I, I did a lot of talking. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's good. Hey, like <laughs> I, I told said, you, I would story steer time this one. with Papa Total. There you go. There you go. Uh, thank you again for joining us for episode 225. Uh, looking forward to 226. I think we've got a great idea for what we're going to be doing there. We just we have a list of 
episodes we want to do throughout the year, but I think I've changed gears for this next idea. And uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So stick with us. Uh, and until next time, uh, this is Carl. This is Josh. And we're coming to you from the Astronomicon where the more things change, the more they stay the same. And where the doomsday clock moves ever forwards. I like that one. All right. This episode of The Independent Characters is protected by the Creative Commons license. If you have further questions as to its use, you can find information on the front page at theindependentcharacters.com. Thank you.